and welcome to Summer Science Live, the very first live broadcast of this special summer event. My name is Dr Anna Pajajski. I'm a material scientist, writer and storyteller and unfortunately Roma Agrawal can't be with us today. But what I'm going to be doing is taking you through the next few hours meeting some of the amazing scientists that we've got here at the Royal Society's Summer Exhibition. We'll be hearing everything from the science of chocolate to taking a deep dive down to the bottom of the ocean and even finding out how berries might hold the solution to the problem of sustainable energy. Throughout this afternoon we would love to hear from you and you can send your questions and comments over to our scientific experts on slido.com. So if you go to slido.com and enter the code SSE22, I will be taking your questions and putting them to our scientific experts. So do please get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. We've also got live captioning today, so if you want to see that, then you can click on subtitles or live captioning, uh, sorry, um, uh, 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 closed captioning, sorry, um, and you'll be able to see those there. If you want to tweet us today, you can get in touch as well at Summer Science Live. Now, to give you a bit of a background to these events, the Summer Science Exhibition all started back in 1778 with the uh, president of the Royal Society then called uh, Joseph Banks. Now, Joseph Banks started these events called Conversaciones, which later became called Soirees. And these events were basically so that the Royal Society's fellows could exhibit and sort of broadcast their scientific ideas, their great new um, amazing science that they've been working on throughout the year. Now eventually those events sort of became uh, bigger and bigger and bigger and now they are public facing events uh, where people can come and hear from UK scientists about all of the amazing stuff that they have been working on throughout the year. This is the first time that the Summer Science Exhibition has been back in the building since 2019. The 2020 and 2021 uh, events were all online and if you want to check those out they're actually still online so you can go and watch those back on the Royal Society uh, website uh, so if you want even more summer science exhibition content today then those are available too. But for now I'm really excited to be joined by my first guests on the sofa today uh, Dr Seraphine Padikis and Rhiney Sherratt from the University of Essex and you're here at the Royal Society Summer Exhibition t t talking to us about mind over matter so tell me what have you got on your head? <laughs> so what I'm wearing now is an EEG headset. So an EEG, EEG headset, stands for okay. electroencephalography. Mm -hmm. So essentially it is a device, it is a set of sensors embedded in this elastic cap that are able to pick up the electrical activity of my brain. Okay. If there is any, that is, <laughs> going on. <clears throat> so yeah. And uh, more specifically, this is a kind of uh, dry electro technology, as we say, which, you know, the sensor simply needs to touch my head and can measure the activity of my brain uh -huh. without having to add anything obtrusive like gel or anything else. So you yeah. can put on this special swimming cap yeah. <laughs> and your, the electrical signals from your brain are able to be picked up by those sensors. Exactly. Why do we want to do this? Well, the main reason we do this is because we want to establish what we call a brain-computer interface system. Now, what is that? These are systems that are able to somehow circumvent mm -hmm. the normal pathways that humans uh, use to interact, which is the peripheral nervous system and our muscles, of course, our limbs, and uh, try to manipulate the world or establish communication directly through our brain. So okay. in this way, what we really want to do is circumvent any kind of disability that disrupts the, the life of people that are inflicted by it. Sure, okay, and what sort of, uh, what sort of benefits would this bring to patients? Well, uh, as I said, this can become effectively an assistive technology. So mm -hmm. you can imagine people using a brain computer interface or a BCI, as mm -hmm. we call the acronyms. They can use a BCI, for instance, to communicate through text spellers. Mm -hmm. You can imagine especially how useful this would be for people, for instance, with uh, terminal amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, that they have no other way to communicate, but their brain activity is intact and they are cognitively fine. and 
they are essentially locked into their body and what we are trying to do essentially is unlock them. But there are also other applications like, uh, for instance, controlling a telepresence robot and meeting your friends and family in other rooms or controlling an orthotic device. And even uh, these days, uh, this technology also has applications in neuro rehabilitation. So somehow using a BCI to get rid of the BCI. Sure. So how does this compare with other technologies that are trying to do a similar thing? Well, of course, there are a number of other assistive technologies. There are eye trackers. There are many other things. I would say that uh, the BCI maybe, uh, I don't know if Rainy agrees, it's maybe a kind of uh, last resort, okay. you may say, yeah. Yeah. because maybe it's a little harder to establish. Uh, so you need uh, very elaborate machine learning techniques. The signal we are recording and have to use is a really bad signal, very low signal-to-noise okay. ratio, which is not the case for some of these other technologies. Sure. However, we are those that have the least prerequisites from the end user, from okay. the patient. So you just need to be able to think, right? Sure. And you don't need to be able to move, not even uh, your eye blinks. So okay. maybe if I can add, yeah. the difference is that the difference is between having a communication and not being able to communicate. So, so mm -hmm. speed is not really, really the biggest issue. Yeah. Is of course is an issue because as soon as you're trained, and this is not something which we put on and it's working. It has to be calibrated for each individual independently. Um, but yeah, so it, if someone has a muscle left and can control this muscle, that's mm -hmm. the way to go. And this is then the next frontiers. Hopefully in a few years we will have more robust systems. So how far through the development process are you? We can obviously see that there's a prototype here today. How close do you think you are to actually implementing this? There are different um, systems already out there today who work and are in use by patients. Mm -hmm. So it really depends a little bit uh, on the application. So if you want to use this to really control a dextrot movement of the hand, that's probably not um, possible now to a good degree. However, what we can do now is support stroke patients, or this is a study we're currently running, to detect the intent. And if we can detect an intent of the movement, we can use some other technology like a robot to, to move the hand and then closing the, the, the feedback loops and hopefully the brain learns quicker. Another project we're working on is mathematics anxiety. So how can we use this? We can detect some mental states and if we can detect, for example, yeah, frustration or, or anxiety, Okay. Um, or other emotional states, then, then if we can detect those, we could change adaptively our learning environment and keep the learner in the flow so that it's, it's really a challenging activity and we hopefully get rid of <laughs> to some of the <laughs> mathematics anxiety, which is really a big problem in schools. Sure, sure, that's really interesting. If I can add to, yeah. I mean, maybe you can say that we are at the point that now this technology is moving finally out mm -hmm. of the lab, but it's not quite there yet, yeah. so there are still uh, advances that we really need on multiple fronts, both at the hardware level, so we need better signal. There are a lot of people working on that, uh, both on the algorithm side, so having algorithms that are able to increase the accuracy of this decoding of the mental states we're trying to do, and uh, yeah, maybe also in the interaction aspects. So yeah, we're moving towards applications, real commercial yeah. industrial applications, but maybe not exactly there yet. Yeah. These things and take time. It's yeah. difficult also to put in numbers because you always hear five mm. to ten years, whatever technology mm. is ready in ten years. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah <laughs> so sure. we can pick up this number, but I think the important thing is the technology is reliable enough so that the end user who really benefits from it really mm. has has the benefit. Yeah, yeah, sure. And what about the teams of scientists behind this then? What, what are your backgrounds in terms of the subjects that you studied and how diverse is your team in terms of the backgrounds that people mm -hmm. have been you know, bringing to the table? We are a multidisciplinary bunch. Yeah. I mean, in my background is computer science with, with electronic engineering, yeah. biomedical engineering a mix, and biomedical uh -huh. informatics. We have, have colleagues from psychology. We work with people from biology, from, from with medical doctors, with mathematicians. Um, because we need, we need to involve everyone if we want to create the systems which have impact. Because, you know, if, if we in the lab, we design something which is doing a really nice job, this doesn't mean it translates into NHS processes and yeah. procedures and really arrives at the end user. So we need to include everyone, um, which is very beautiful and very challenging yeah, <laughs> at the I same bet. time, yeah. because we all f need to find a common vocabulary. Yes. Can you imagine 10 people in a room, everyone from a different background, and then you start discussing a topic. So it takes some time to just bring everyone at the same level sure. and yeah. agree on 
yeah. <laughs> what you agree and disagree on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what a biologist says a cell is is very different from a computer scientist, yeah. right? So you have to use, find a common language. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And exactly. how they understand things. Is yeah, different. I can imagine, yeah. So you've been at the Summer Science Exhibition now for a few days. What sort of reaction from the public have you had? The public is super interested. Yeah. It, it's, it's really amazing. I, I did not expect it that we were engaged basically from, from, from 10 to 6 in yeah. discussion. Yeah. <laughs> it's very exhausting, but also very good to, to see that people is really interested. Yeah. Some, they come with some misconceptions, which okay. allows us to, because you know, it, yeah, we get, <laughs> it's not like bad kind of strange question. My thoughts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, we, we, my yeah. so we get, we get, uh, we are in a domain which is, which is very, yeah, Challenging, <laughs> and let me let me just say it like this. But it's mm. good to have a conversation and see how other perceive this, or getting some good feedback also from from the public because yes. you know they they see it for the first time. You try to explain it, and then you figure out, oh, I could improve this, I could improve that, and then someone makes this really nice comment, and so it's really it's really pleasant, yeah. <laughs> even if it's challenging and tiring. But it's really good. Yeah. What's been the most challenging question that you've had from the public this week? Oh. <laughs> um, in terms, of, I, I just I I had some really interesting discussions with people from uh, so from engineering in general, how to improve specific things or simple simple um, questions where people challenge the the way we do it mm. or why we do it because it, it's just very often there's one word missing in the in the explanation and then it you know you don't really understand why why this technology can be so so important. Yeah. Um, and so, just being very specific and, and answering this, this, this question or just removing the doubts uh, was really a challenge. I mean, this was not a no, really specific answer, <laughs> but um, this was at least what, what, what I remember the, um, the most, yeah. having this, this conversation about what's yeah. possible, what's not, and, and just, just getting rid of the fears, as Simis mm -hmm. was saying, yeah. about that we can remotely control <laughs> people. The easier way to remotely yeah. control it. <laughs> totally, yeah, exactly. And it's one of the key benefits, I think, to being at an event like this is um, having that feedback from the public, and yeah. you know that can even influence the direction that your research yeah. goes in. Hearing their, you know, wants and needs and concerns about the work. Exactly. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining me today, um, Dr. Seraphim Padikis and Ryan Sheriff from the University of thank Essex. You. Thank you so much. Best of luck with your research. Thank you. I'm now joined in the studio um, by Georgina Limon Vega, who's going to be talking to me about the most deadliest animal on earth, which might not be the one that you expect. Georgina, welcome to the Royal Society Hi. sofa. Thank you. <laughs> so tell me, what is the most deadly animal on earth? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, probably one of the smallest ones can be very dangerous, mm -hmm. like uh, mosquito ticks, a lot of vectors that uh, transmit diseases to animals and also to humans. So it's yeah. also trying to find the balance between like, and the interaction between different animal and species. Yes, uh -huh. sure. So tell me then about your research. What have you brought to the Royal Society today? Yeah, so well, yeah, I'm, I'm an epidemiologist, a vet by training. So oh, okay. um, what we've uh, one of the stands that, that we have it there today in the Royal Society is trying to take people through the disease investigation, outbreak investigation, so from when you have a, a, a suspicion of a disease and so then they can go through all the interaction, um, discover what the disease is, how can we control it, how it's spread, so kids can play with it and, and see all the process that we go as a scientist when, when we are doing outbreak investigation and, and trying to control it. So. Fantastic. So some, yeah. some hands-on demonstrations yeah. then of how disease is yeah. spread throughout populations. Exactly. And of course this is something that we have all been very sort of impacted by directly yeah. um, in the last few years. So I bet you've had a lot of public interest in terms of understanding that spread and then presumably an important aspect is then controlling that spread, right? So how do you go about that? Yeah, so I mean we have different examples. I think COVID is one of the examples. Yeah. We have other, other examples like uh, Zika and uh, Nipah virus. So this is a... Uh, have tra uh, animals play a role on this? So we have I tried to explain what a zoonotic disease is, so th that disease that transmit from animals to to humans, uh, or vector bond diseases. This one that transmit by uh, mosquitoes or another vector like uh, ticks or midges. Mm -hmm. um, so they can go um, through each stage and, and and they get one disease and and go step by step. So I mm. think it's quite quite. So clear. it's the idea to 
and study those kind of intermediaries, you know, the, the animals, the insects that carry the diseases, like mosquitoes, mm -hmm. for example, and target them as a way of stopping the spread of disease before it gets to humans. Yeah, so we, we, we explore different ways of control diseases. So one is controlling the, the vector. So it can be simple things like no living water, so the, so, the, so the vectors cannot put eggs and reproduce there. And to, to, towards something much more complicated like modify, the genetically modify the, the, the mosquitoes so wow. they cannot spread the, the disease. Uh, and then we, we explore other, other ways of, of control like vaccines, like if there is a vaccine or not and mm -hmm. if it is how they can see how, how, how the way it, it works. Um, and other things like physical barriers or um, simply just cleaning the pen better when, when, where, the, where the animals are. Mm -hmm. So you can go from very simple ways of controlling diseases yeah. to very complicated. All the way uh, up to genetic engineering yeah. of mosquitoes. Yeah. Wow, and so can you maybe tell me a story about one example of a disease that you've been studying to try and control the spread of? Yeah, so I mean, I've been, I've worked quite close with it, foot and mouth disease and, um, and lumpy skin disease. Um, this one, lumpy skin, uh, it's been in Africa for a for, for long time, but now it's starting to spread through Asia mm -hmm. and it's a lot of concern that it will also start spreading north now with uh, climate change, so it is transmitted by, by, by mosquitoes. It's, it's still, we're still trying to understand all the vectors that can, can transmit it. So we've been doing a lot of work in endemic countries in Africa, trying to see um, how, how it's transmitted, things like bringing animals together is a risk or yeah. uh, keeping it in certain ways can control it or, or spread um, and working with farmers with people in the field because uh, they have also a lot of experience they've been seeing it for a long time so trying to understand um, how, it, how it works and then bringing back samples to the lab, then people in the lab trying to run the, the test, understanding better, back to the field. So it's kind of a, a circle there to, to, to put a lot of uh, players mm, uh, yeah. trying to understand. So, so what sort of scientists do you have then working on these problems? Yeah, so we have uh, uh, people that um, understand the immune response or immunologists, uh, try people that are developing the vaccines in the lab, so vaccinologists trying to under, um, develop vaccines that are specific for the disease. But we start also working with other institutions that have social scientists or um, economists to try to tackle every angle and, 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 and understand it and control it. Yeah. Um, so what sort of questions have you had from the public then at the Summer Science Exhibition this year? Yeah, so we have questions like, uh, is it very dangerous? Can, can virus escape from the lab? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, a fear that some people have. Mm. But it, it is very highly controlled. Like the, the, the biosecurity in a lab dealing with these diseases is, is, is very high. You know? mm. So, for example, in the high contaminant period, you have to shower out every time you've been going in the lab. So you have to change clothes and then wow. shower out. So, okay. so it's really like highly controlled and biosecurity is very high. So the risk is, is super, super low. So people can be sure that this is a very unlikely event. Yes. But I think it's a fear that a lot of people have. Sure, yeah, but so. the diseases are always contained within the yeah. lab. And yeah. is it true that some of the, um, the diseases that you will study, there'll be a modified form? So they actually, there is no risk of them kind of Spreading. Yeah, so right? we, for example, um, when we bring samples from endemic countries, uh, we they call it heat inactivated, so we've kind of warmed <laughs> the sample, like put it at a certain temperature so the virus is inactivated, mm -hmm. so it's, it's very low, low risk. So we have a lot of measurements to, 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 to transport samples in a very safe way, so mm -hmm. we have like two or three containers and then up with an eye, so it, it, yeah. different ways to, to make sure it's safe when, sure. when we are interested. So you've got lots of different scientists yeah. working on this problem. Yeah. Um, can you give us a sense of what one of their labs might look like? I'm sort of picturing, you know, great big cages of mosquitoes here and then some scientists doing gene engineering over here. What's the reality like? Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm mainly a person from the field more than the lab, so I, I interact with, a lot with people from the lab, but no, it's quite, uh, well, it has a lot of the, like, microscope and a lot of the machines mm -hmm. to like, see if, um, uh, for example, run the PCRs to see the, if, if a sample have the DNA of a, 
uh, of a virus that we're interested in. So yeah, there are a lot of machines, but uh, benches working on, but it's nothing scary. I think like yeah. people is like working just like uh, normal. We're taking a lot of uh, control, uh, safety measures, mm -hmm. but in a normal way, really. Yeah. It's, not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not crazy people working there or like with really a lot of uh, equipment. It's sure. just like... Uh, um, just a normal <laughs> love. <laughs> so you said that your work is mainly in the field. Yeah. What sort of challenges do you encounter when yeah. you're working in the field? Yeah, so well, sometimes it's the distance because we want to go and see where the, the disease is. And for this, we have to sometimes travel a lot. So like long journeys in, in a car and then walking a lot yeah. so to get to places of, uh, that are very isolated. So that, that is one. Language barrier can be one. So a lot yeah. of places you need a translator. Um, uh, but it's not just the language as well, like people, how people interpret things or been doing the cultural part of it, of the disease, or, or dealing with it. So it's trying to understand why people do things, because it's normally a reason behind it. That it's not very obvious at the beginning. But, um, so yeah, I think distance and, and, and language is most of the... Sure. Uh, and what's your hope for your research? What, what do you want to achieve? Yeah, well, I think... Our main aim is to start controlling diseases and and, and make people's livelihoods uh, more sustainable mm -hmm. because a lot of these diseases uh, are quite detrimental for people. So yeah. it's, it's the animal getting ill, but also it's the livelihoods, uh, how they, the, the milk or the meat they produce is probably the fees for kids to go into school. So if we can improve people's livelihoods and make it better and, and a safer place, uh, that yeah. would be that's the dream. Fantastic. But <laughs> yeah. working with the people who are directly affected by those diseases must be really gratifying and make you feel like you're really making a difference. Yeah, I think like once we just start controlling it and, and working through the barriers, it, it's very gratifying and, yeah. and very interesting discussing with them and understanding it. So. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So finally, what's been your favourite bit about taking part in the Summer Science Exhibition this week? Uh, I think just looking at the range of different uh, uh, stands and, and science that, that, that goes in, in here. So it, it's really, really diverse and, and very exciting to see what other people is working on and, and potentially how can we interact with other, with, with other scientists. To, yes, to solve and collaboration, right, because working in teams is, yeah. is really key to yeah. solving some of the big problems. Yeah, yeah I think a lot of the, the problems nowadays are multifactorial, so we really have to take into account different things like the environment, the animal diseases, the human side. So, like, yeah, seeing the different parts of it here is very yeah. exciting. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you for joining me, Georgina yeah. Limon Vega yeah. from the Purbright Institute. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, People at home, don't forget you can send your questions in to us on slido.com if you enter the code SSE22. I will be putting your questions to all of our scientific experts throughout the programme today. Now we're going to go to Edinburgh to meet Dr. Kartik Sub from the University of Edinburgh who's going to tell us about how to programme proteins. Proteins are essential for life on the planet. They're tiny biological machines that perform important functions in our bodies. Things like repair, digestion, production of energy, bolstering our immunity and so on. I find it hard to believe that the amazing array of proteins we see in nature makes up just a small fraction of all possible proteins. I'm here to meet a team who are striving to give nature a bit of a helping hand. Hello, I'm Esme, nice Hello, to meet Esme. you. Hello Esme, I'm Kartik, nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Chris, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. So tell me about this place, what are we doing here? So we're standing in the Edinburgh Genome Foundry and this is where we make the DNA instructions that we use to make our custom proteins. And then we go upstairs to the EPPF and we express that we actually make those proteins and characterise them and understand how they behave. Incredible. Now this might sound like a bit of a silly question, but what's a protein made of? No, no, that's not a silly question at all. Proteins are chemicals, long molecules, that are made of building blocks called amino acids, and this is an amino acid here, this is a, a representation of it. And uh, there's 20 different amino acids with different chemical variants here. In nature, or you can do this chemically as well, you can link together, thank you, Cardi, um, you can link together these amino, amino acid building blocks to make long protein molecules. And on average, um, proteins have about 200 to 300 building blocks inside them. And so if you think about that, the, the, with 20 different options at each of these positions, even if you had 100 building block protein, that's 20 to the power of 100 possible combinations, and that's 
10 with 130 zeros after it. So this is an absolutely staggering amount of possible proteins. And only a tiny, tiny little fraction of those have been explored in nature, despite the amazing complexity of biological systems. That's a huge number. So are you saying that nature's been a bit lazy when it comes to making proteins? Evolution is definitely a much better optimization algorithm than it is a sort of innovation engine. So it's much easier to make existing proteins better than it is to make totally new proteins. But we don't have the same types of restrictions that evolution has. So we can make giant leaps instead of small steps. Ah, oh, how hard is it to make a new protein? Well, if you think of a protein as a tiny molecular machine that's trying to carry out a function, then it's Im incredibly important to model the physics that goes on in this. Without considering the physics, it'll be like a toddler trying to build a really tall stack of Lego blocks without considering stability. The frustrating thing about this is that many of the experiments will result in nothing. They will just come down crashing. Well, I've heard you've got a demonstration that might clear this all up for me. Absolutely, yeah. Do you want to come and see? Let's go. So, I'm seeing a lot of people in coloured tops, but what actually are we doing here? So, we're going to do a protein folding simulation, but we're going to do it with people rather than molecules. Interesting. So, shall we see it in action? Yes, let's go. Cool. Right, okay. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to make the polypeptide. Could we have the N-terminus uh, up at the front? So, what Chris is doing here is he's trying to mimic a computer simulation. Each person here is going to be uh, pretending to be an amino acid, which is a component of a protein. And as you can see, they're lined up with either a left or a right hand out. And in a minute, what we're going to do is ask them to play the simulation out. And they're going to try to find other amino acids to either move towards or move away from. That's it. This is the way. This compact. No, no, we've got a broken chain. There we go. There we go. We've got a salt bridge. We've got one salt bridge. Right. We can rearrange. Can we rearrange? Oh, can we break you up temporarily? Yes. Right, compact. Compact, everybody together. Right here. Right, and then compact. Yes. This is it. We've got a stable. Right, and stop. This is great. What have we just seen here? So we ran our simulation and then the polypeptide chain, the protein folded up into a compact three-dimensional structure, or two-dimensional in this case. And it seemed very chaotic. Is this a good structure? So, so yeah, absolutely. I think this is a really nice a representation of what happens on a molecular level. You know, when the forces that fold up the protein, they make the chain wiggle and jiggle until it gets, and it folds and unfolds and goes back until it gets to this energetically stable state. And this is what we've got here, basically. Hopefully you can see that we have all of the black amino acids in the middle. These are hydrophobic, they don't like water, so they want to be hidden out from this environment here. And we've got all of the blue and red and white, which like water, all on the outside. And you can see that the blue and red have found each other and paired up. So this is a good structure. What this simulation shows you is how a protein folds. But one of the problems that we're excited by is the inverse problem, where you give us the shape, this shape, for example, to design a vaccine for, for a virus, and then ask the question, what sequence of colors should we line up in order to end up here? All right, thanks very much, amino acids. Well, that did seem quite difficult in the end. Absolutely. So hopefully the demonstration showed you that it's difficult to design a sequence of building blocks that will make a protein that forms into a compact structure repeatably. And this is really this difficult problem is the reason that Kartik and I collaborate between the School of Informatics and the School of Biological Sciences to make new computer algorithms that we can use to make proteins that go beyond nature. Computer algorithms are very effective at detecting patterns. And what Chris and I are trying to do is try to teach these algorithms to detect patterns that result in consistent successes or perhaps even failures. Now, Kartik, I heard that you actually worked at Disney before you returned to a life of academia. Was it a similar skill set you used there? Well, that was magic of a different kind about 10 years ago. The animation and special effects industries rely heavily on approximate physics model. Uh, but what's really cool about the work that Chris and I are doing together is that this goes beyond entertainment. We're trying to solve problems, maybe even speed nature up. So you're speeding up nature with the help of technology. Now, is this just 
science for the sake of science? Or is this science that can actually help us one day? It's going to help humanity, there's no doubt about that. Natural proteins are incredibly important. We use them broadly already in all sorts of areas. But if we can design new proteins that go beyond nature, then we can start to solve problems in medicine and agriculture related to sustainability in the environment. And it's starting to happen now. We really are at the beginning of a revolution when it comes to protein design. Well, thank you so much for chatting to me, guys. And there you have it. Nature has so many proteins left undiscovered and experts are using AI to try and discover them. And hopefully these discoveries will help us all out someday. I'm so excited to see how this science progresses in the future. Back to you guys at the Royal Society. Researchers there from the University of Edinburgh telling us all about how to program proteins. It's mind-blowing stuff. Um, I'm joined here now on the Royal Society sofa with Dr. Chloe James from the University of Salford and Dr. Heather Allison from the University of Liverpool. Welcome. Thank you. Now, tell me about your exhibit. It's all about um, the microbial Muppet Masters. Tell me more. Puppet masters. So the so the puppet masters. These. This is what we're working with. Uh, these are bacteriophages. Okay. So what's a bacteriophage? A bacteriophage is a virus, but it doesn't infect human or animal cells. It actually infects bacterial cells. Ah, okay. Um, and so they use these tail fibres to infect the bacteria that they're targeting, uh, to recognise the molecules on the surface, and then they can infect them. And we're researching the different ways that they then um, can change the evolution of bacterial populations. So this is a big, blown-up 3D printed version. How small would one of these be in real life? Yeah, this is absolutely <laughs> massive. Um, so normally, this capsid head would be around about 50 nanometers in diameter. Wow, so really small. So yeah, incredibly small. So yeah. bacteria are about a millionth of a meter, and so phages are about 20 times smaller than that. Okay. So pre pretty tiny. Uh, so uh, we've got some models of. So these are uh, models of bacteria, um, in which case we need even tinier. Oh well. These are still massive models of bacteria yeah. phage. Um, and we've designed them to demonstrate some of the different ways that phages can affect bacteria. OK, and what does this all have to do with us, really? Why, why do you want to study these bacteria phages? Well, I mean, bacteria phages are the most abundant organism on the planet. For every grain of sand, there's about 1,000 bacteria phages. Wow. Um, so there's billions and billions and billions of them. Um, but there's a huge amount we don't know about them. Um, in our particular research, we're interested in cystic fibrosis um, and the lungs of people with cystic fibrosis are infected with, uh, cr cr well, chronically infected with lots of different bacteria and fungi. Um, and phages have quite an important role to play in that infection. Um, there's a bit of a, of a Jekyll and Hyde relationship, isn't there? In, yes. In that some phages are being used as therapy to kill the bacteria. Um, so that's a really exciting new treatment, particularly as lots of bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics. Um, but the type of phages that we're really, really interested in uh, for actually put, form a partnership with the bacteria and they can help the bacteria to adapt and survive longer in the cystic fibrosis lung. So the more we can try and understand how that works, then we can better understand how we can manage these infections. So hacking nature to kind of turn it against itself in a little way to conduct, to, to um, cure these diseases. Um, talk to me about these other models that you've got. What, we've heard about bacteriophages looking like this. What's this one? So this is a model of the, the way in which we can use phages for phage therapy. Okay. So Sh Glover, you want to show them? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is a bacterium, this is a phage. Um, what you notice with these phages is all the phages are different. They're incredibly diverse. So there's different colours, there's different shapes and sizes. So if I try to infect this bacterium, let's give a go with this one. The what? phage recognise molecules on the cell in a very specific way. Okay. And not every interaction with the phage is going to be productive. Okay. So. Do you want to try? Doesn't always work. Gosh, yes, OK. So I'm a little phage, and I'm coming into my bacteria. I'm going to adjoin to the surface. Nothing happened. Nothing happened, OK. Right, I'm going to try this one. Right, let's see. Oh. No, nothing happened. So this would be happening in the body, in, for example, right? They'd be coming along, lots of uh -huh. different phages, interacting with this um, bacteria. I feel like... 
You killed the cell. I killed the cell. Amazing. I and look good. at all the phages that you made. Okay, so we've reproduced phages using a bacterial cell. And they cell. look identical to the phage that did the infection. Yes. And they're going to go on to kill other cells that look just like this one. So these one. will then go on and they'll meet another one and reproduce. So if this was causing the infection, all of its siblings are going to die as well. Okay. So what we want to do is to modify one of these so that it doesn't reproduce in that way. Is that right? Well, if you want to do, use it for therapy, you don't okay. want to modify it at all. You want to harvest its ability to see the pathogen and let it do its thing. Gotcha. So we actually want to be helping these little guys do what they do and, and seek out its cells. Seek out its bacteria and let it do its thing. So how do you do that? So people can isolate phages from all over the place. The most common place is from sewage, um, and then you purify the phage out from there. Okay. The, the big challenge is, that particularly in cystic fibrosis, there's been some big good news stories recently where phage therapy has worked. But it's quite important to manage expectations for that, because as these models demonstrate, the phages are incredibly specific. Mm -hmm. So some phages that are able to kill um, a bacterial population in the lungs of one person might not work um, in the same, even if it's the same species, they might not work against the other um, oh, okay. bacteria and somebody else. So at the moment, it's really tantalizing, exciting um, therapy, but the technology is not quite there yet um, to, to sort of have this as a, it's, it's never going to be a one fits all type of therapy. Okay, so does that mean that you would have to work with the individual patient and study their cells and what's going on in the bacteria in them in order to tackle it correctly and so that it's going to work for their body, is that right? Potentially, it'll have to be that specific. Yeah, okay. Potentially. Yeah, so this is what we call personalised medicine and exactly. it's something that we're hearing quite a lot about now as kind of the future of medicine and being able to um, target what we do to an individual patient. Is that ever going to be realistic in your work? It, it could be, we're not sure, but actually we want to get across the message that there are other types of phage as well. Um, so we work with temperate phage. So if you remember earlier I said sometimes phages form a partnership with yeah. their bacteria and can make the bacteria cause more severe disease. So we want to understand how that works as well. Have we got time to tell you, show you our second model yes, quickly? Yes, please. So, so this is the second model that demonstrates that. Um, so you're going to try and infect me now, aren't you? Well, not you personally. <laughs> yeah, absolutely <laughs> only not Only your bacteria, because bacteriophages only infect bacteria. Yeah. Right? So, um, let you have a go? Yes. I'm excited about this. Right, so same thing again. Bacteriophage coming along to the bacteria, interacting with it. No result. No result. Fine. I'll let you have another go. Okay. <laughs> right. It's got a circle. Oh, here we go. Oh. Very good. Now, that had a very different effect on the cell, didn't it? Yes. The cell actually grew. Ah, OK. So at the Summer Science Exhibition, we were referring to that as the acquisition of a superpower. I like it. Tell me more. <laughs> okay. So this is the kind of thing that we're studying. Yeah. So what's happened is during the phage infection, the genetic information inside the phage has been acquired by the host cell mm -hmm. and it's entered into the chromosome of the bacteria. Now that could be anywhere, the, the bacterial cells acquired anywhere from 50 to about 250 genes. Okay. That's a lot of genetic information and it's been able to change the traits of the host cell. We don't actually understand a lot about the traits that have been altered, and that's what we're studying. But it's this ability, my claw hands, <laughs> it's this ability to, to manipulate the bacteria like a puppet master. I see. That is, gives the name of our exhibition, and it's those traits that we're studying. So we've actually found one of the phages that we're studying that changes the rate at which the, um, the, set, the, the pathogen Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolated from the lung of a cystic fibrosis patient, the rate at which it can grow. So we know that this is one of the traits that is given by a single bacteriophage. Mm. And so 
bacteria have been bombarded with phage for millions of years yeah. and they've kind of been in this evolutionary dance and they've so phages over the years have um, enabled pathogens to evolve and if we can understand more about that we can understand how to better uh, manage the disease so there's all this dark matter at the moment isn't there and, and we're trying to pull the curtains back on that um, and hopefully the ideal therapy is one that doesn't kill the bacteria but actually makes it less well adapted to the environment and less able to cause disease because then the sort of um, development of resistance will be slower because you're not actually trying to kill the bacterium. So that's a, like a real long-term plan uh, but I think our part to play with that at the moment is to identify the function of those genes. So once you understand how these genes work you can then start trying to we can target those traits. Yes. We can we can make those advantages less ad advantageous. Gotcha. So we've got a question in on Slido from Kate who asks, will bacteriophages be the solution, the solution to the antibiotic crisis? Well, that requires a crystal ball. <laughs> and I don't think any of us have a crystal ball, but it's certainly one of the solutions that certain many labs across the world are working on. Fantastic. I think, you know, antimicrobial resistance is such a global challenge yeah. and to tackle it, then it needs to come from all sides, from all, all kind of sectors of the community. And there's lots of exciting new therapies coming along and I think phage therapy is one of them. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And I think the UK is playing a big part in that as well. So some of the first clinical trials have occurred in the UK and I am very proud to say and be a part of the UK scientific community. Yeah, well, thank you for telling me all about your work. It's completely blown my mind. I knew nothing about this before, but now I understand a lot more. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Chloe James and Heather Allison. Um, I'm delighted to be joined now by another of our scientists of the Summer Science Exhibition. It's Dr. Sina Fisher from the University of Nottingham, who's going to be telling me about a topic that is very close to my heart. We're going to be hearing about how science is impacting the research on the science of chocolate. Now don't forget you can send our scientists your questions at slido.com by putting in the code SSE22 and I will be putting your questions to our scientists. So Dr. Sina Fisher, welcome to the sofa. Thank you for having me. Come and tell me about your research that you're exhibiting here. Yes, so we studied the chocolate making process and in particular one aspect of that and that's the fermentation. So I brought you here a cacao pod, this is sort of the outside. They come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and colors, some are red, some are green. Uh, and we cut one open here for you to see the inside. So these are the cacao beans and they are surrounded by this uh, pulp you can see a little bit better here it's sort of um, moist and and white initially and it contains a lot of sugar okay and if you smell uh, the inside of these beans so the inside of this pod what can you smell it smells quite fresh mm -hmm. quite nutty fruity fruity definitely citrusy maybe oh, yeah but certainly doesn't smell like cacao no, no chocolate whatsoever. No, no chocolate whatsoever. <laughs> In comparison, if you smell these beans. Oh, yeah. So these feel much more dry than what we just had there. It's almost like quite astringent, quite sort of sour. Almost like coffee. Yeah, so this is certainly much more nutty and much more going yes. into the direction of chocolate already. Yeah. So we're getting close here. Now the difference between this fresh bean, these fresh mm -hmm. beans coming from the pod and these drier beans is that these were fermented. Okay. Um, fermentation is of course microbes acting on food or other products, uh, in this case uh, the cacao beans, and changing them in a way. And um, yeah, it has been, this has been a process that has been utilized by farmers for ages to make chocolate in the end. Without the fermentation, you, you could roast these beans all you liked, you would never be able to turn them into chocolate. They would remain very bitter, they would remain, these, these citrusy flavors would remain predominant and you would not get the chocolatey taste. So in the production making process of chocolate making, that fermentation process is crucial to the flavours that we love in Absolutely, chocolate. Absolutely, yes. So where does the science come in then? 
We study this process. We investigate which microbes are present during the fermentation and how they change. The fermentation is usually done, not usually, it's done at the farms. Yep. So the cacao is harvested by farmers and these beans and the mucusy-like pulp is, are scooped into big wooden boxes and then the beans are left there to ferment for about five days. And after that time, they would have this color and they would be placed outside to dry and then they're ready to shipment to the chocolatier and then they would proceed with further refinement steps. And a good chocolatier is able to really tease out all these great notes in the chocolate, but if they get low quality beans, there's nothing they can do about it. So the fermentation is really crucial in this process. And what we want to know, if we have chocolate that tastes fruity, has berry notes, and we have a chocolate in comparison that has more floral notes or almost tastes like vanilla, then what was the difference during the fermentation? Okay. So sort of reverse engineering almost, working out what happened during that process, what microbes were acting to create that fermentation. Exactly. And then I guess if you want to, in the future, purposefully create certain flavours in a chocolate, you would be able, you would know what bacteria or what microbes are required. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's much more complicated than, let's say, for example, wine making. Okay. Because, as you know, wine is also fermented, but here we need yeast and it's mainly yeast. There are a lot of different yeast strains known mm -hmm. to brewers and they would even cultivate them and add them to their certain wines. Uh, although uh, yeast it is already growing on the grapes themselves, so it's not technically required, but they can refine it, this sure. process. But for the, the fermentation of cacao, we've noticed that if you just add yeast, for example, you would not be able to produce these cacao notes. And if you just add bacteria of certain kind, you would also not get this, these different flavors. What you really need to have is a specific combination. And of course, if I start to combine only three things, it goes up. But we have, we have studied this in several thousand samples now, and we see hundreds and difference of microbes wow. during the fermentation. Their profiles change from day one to day five. In, in concert with that, the pH changes, the temperature changes, and all of these are important factors. Yeah. So it's a just, it's a much more complicated process. A very complex process. And so are those, uh, the microbes that are responsible for the fermentation, are those present, they must be present presumably sort of in the bean or in the place in which the beans are coming from. So do you see bacterial variation in terms of where the beans have grown and is that the sort of root of the different flavors? It's an excellent question. Yes, so we asked this as well because it wasn't known, right? So this process was completely not studied scientifically. Mm -hmm. Farmers have a certain ability to control fermentation by stirring, changing temperature, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But what we did was we went to Colombia and to Trinidad, and we worked with farmers there. They are usually small farms, family run. And we were asking them, well, would, would we be allowed to participate in your harvests and take samples? So we went, we took samples from the surface of the pod, from the insides of the pod, from the boxes that the fermentation is occurring in, and then throughout, in order to answer these questions. And basically the answer is, they are everywhere. Uh, and they are very diverse between different farms. So not even, say, Colombia has a different microbiome mm -hmm. to Trinidad, but a specific farm in Colombia has a very specific microbiome. Mm -hmm. And this is why if you want to have a really impressively unique experience in tasting chocolate, you need to buy single origin chocolate. Because there you get these unique flavor developments. Um, it, these fine flavor chocolates also have the characteristic that they don't taste the same throughout. So you start tasting a piece of chocolate mm -hmm. and it would start out maybe a little bit bitter, a little bit sour, mm -hmm. but then this would fade away and you would get all kinds of other notes coming through. And this is characteristic for all fine flavored chocolate. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start to bulk, which is what you get in uh, bulk produced chocolate, you lose that characteristic. So you sort of, yeah, it's sort of blend, if in a blend you wouldn't get those specific yes, flavors. Yes. Super interesting. Um, how does your research impact the people that are responsible for growing the beans, you know, farmers that are working on this? Does your research help them in any way? 
This is our goal, yes. So we work with, uh, as I mentioned, these small farmers. Yeah. Uh, actually, the majority of cacao, especially in South America, is grown on small farms. So for them, if a fermentation doesn't go quite well mm -hmm. and produces what we call off flavors, which could be very bitter notes or sometimes emo almost moldy tastes, mm -hmm. then they, the quality of the bean would be much lower than they would like and they'd have to sell it at a less price than they need to basically sustain their businesses. Yeah. So our hope is by correlating flavors and microbes we would be able to advise them on best practices. How do they avoid these uh, bad fermentation outcomes? Sure. Dr. Sina Fisher from the University of Nottingham, thank you for explaining the science of chocolate to me and I wish you all the best with your research. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're now going to go to Dr. Paul Hannell from the University of Essex, who's going to tell us about smashing stereotypes. Nowadays, it feels like we're in conflict all the time, in Parliament, online, even around the dinner table. We believe our values are poles apart from that of our opponent and there's no common ground between us. I'm in Chiswick to meet two researchers who want to flip this idea on its head. What if our values aren't quite as different as we first thought? Hello, hi guys. Hello. Hi. Thank you for meeting me here. So let's talk about your research. What motivated you to tackle this thorny issue? For me, it's a, a fascination with values and how people mentally picture values in their heads and how they mentally picture the values of other people. Because values are at the heart of our most bitter conflicts, such as war. But it's not just war, is it? Because we see it on a smaller scale as well. Yes. So we can also see value conflicts in politics, for example, in political, political debates around issues such as uh, Brexit or climate change, sexism or racism. And these debates make it appear like the country is quite polarized. So not only on a political spectrum between Leave and Remain voters or Conservative and Labour voters, but also between young and older people, for example. And all these debates make it appear like we all have very different values. Mm. Is uh, climate change an example of that? Because it's something I really care about, but it sometimes feels that like other people just don't care the same way. It's a great example. When we see the news about climate change and the damage that it's causing, and then we see uh, examples of behaviors that just keep going, that keep damaging our environment, we can be tempted to draw very sweeping conclusions that other people just don't care about the environment. We often, I think we often forget that uh, the things other people are doing for the environment. So in this morning, hundreds of thousands or even millions of people have been uh, commuting um, by public transport uh, or by bike or walked um, as opposed to using their car. And at the same time, we can forget the times when we've behaved in a manner that's not consistent with protecting the environment. Times when we've um, done things that you know, we know we shouldn't, that are perhaps environmentally damaging. But often we've got a good reason for doing them. We have a reason that we can see, like we, we, we had to make this particular journey that perhaps was actually unnecessary. And that's natural, that's human instinct to, of course, see the reasons why we do things. What we struggle with is to see the reasons why other people do things. And then we can, we can draw big conclusions about differences between the values other people have in our own, but are they right? So I hear you have a demonstration for me. Yes. Absolutely. Should we go? Yes, we do. Yes. Yeah, let's go. Come on. Okay, here we are. How has your work led us to a snooker hall? <laughs> We have found that people are actually much more similar than different in their values. So the way we find that out is we give people surveys which ask them about their values. And these are surveys basically ask them questions about a variety of abstract ideas that people consider to be important to nations around the world. These are ideas like equality, freedom, independence, achievement, power, tradition. The list is very long. To demonstrate, mm -hmm. let's, oops, let's assume that uh, the red balls represent Labour voters and the blue balls represent uh, Conservative or Tory voters. And so if we ask Labour voters about the values of Conservative voters and the other way around, we usually find that they perceive the values of the other group uh, to be quite different to their own values. People think their values are very far apart. Yes, but um, actually, we find that 
So for example, for the value helpfulness, we find that 93% um, overlap, um, mostly meaning that uh, both labor and conservative voters believe that uh, helpfulness is important or very important. And it's particularly important to remember in all this that people are agreeing that these values are highly important. So if we imagine this end of the snooker table as being the distribution of people who are saying that these ideas are really matter a great deal to them, there are relatively few people who consider them to be, say, less important. If we imagine this end of the table being those people who think the values are less important, there aren't so many compared to the people who agree highly with the concepts. Interesting. So what you're saying is even if I might think my values are stronger than the person I'm disagreeing with, I'm probably wrong. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of the time we're all just arguing about nothing. Do you think that we could apply this to politicians when they're tackling big subjects? Well, perhaps, but it, that's also very complex because of the vested interests and the group processes in, involved in political debate. But with people in general, certainly, we found that simple tasks can engage people with discovering their own values and the values of other people. And then they learn that uh, their values aren't as far apart as they thought. And actually, the differences between people tend to be more in how they imagine fulfilling the values than in the values themselves. Amazing. Thank you both. Well, there we go. Maybe the best way to settle a conflict is to focus on what we have in common rather than our differences. Right then, are you guys keen for a game of Winner Stays On? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> Researchers from the University of Essex, they're talking about smashing stereotypes. I'm now joined at the Royal Society with, by Laura Holland from the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Laura, tell me, what do llamas have to do with viruses? Well, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, not an obvious pairing, I think it's fair to say. So we are here talking about a piece of work that has been ongoing since the early days of the pandemic. Um, we're based at the Rosalind Franklin Institute, which is a research institute in South Oxfordshire, and we're working with colleagues at Reading University. Um, at Reading, they have a herd of research llama, which again, probably isn't a phrase that um, many people expected to hear. Um, and we are really interested in um, a very specific type of antibody that llama produce. So llama, their cousins alpaca and camels, um, all have this very special quirk of their immune system uh, that some of their antibodies, which are the molecules that your body makes in response to seeing a, a disease or a pathogen or something it isn't expecting to see, um, those molecules, I'll just show you this. This is a human antibody. Okay. So you can see that it's quite large. It's got several components to it. It's a big um, version. It's a big version. Yeah. <laughs> the most important thing that your antibodies do is that they stick really specifically, like a key in a lock, to one particular target. Yeah. Now, this is human. This is llama. Okay. So it does the same job. It sticks very specifically, but you can see it's missing all of this heavy, complicated machinery, and it's just doing the sticking bit. So we've known that llama can do this for a long time. Uh, it's 1993, I think it was discovered, that their immune systems work in a slightly different way. Uh, but when the pandemic came around, we thought, OK, we, we know how to work with these. We've been using them for a long time. What could we do against COVID? What would a, what would a nanobody do against this emerging uh, pandemic threat? So we produced these. We um, injected llama at uh, Reading with and I'll use the virus now, <laughs> with just, this is COVID, so yeah, friendly just COVID. a friendly COVID, you can ignore <laughs> the eyes, they don't have eyes in real life. Um, you can see all the spikes, we're yeah. familiar with the term spike protein, so yes. we exposed the llama to just the spike, so we didn't give the virus, um, a, any live virus to the llama, mm -hmm. just in the way that the vaccines work, we showed them very specifically the spike protein, mm -hmm. um, that causes the llama to produce antibodies, so these emerge, and those antibodies stick very specifically to the spike protein. And what we discovered is that they stick to it, which helps the, um, the immune system of the llama recognize that there's a threat. But they also kill the virus. They stop it from working because spike is how the llama, is how their virus gets into the cells when it's infecting. So by effectively blocking those spike proteins, you block an infection and the virus dies. So we had these. What we then did the llama's immune system does a brilliant job of making quite strong sticking, 
but we thought we could we could improve that. So by taking it through several rounds of, um, of iteration, looking at the exact sequence of the antibody, we made it stick even more tightly, even more strongly. Um, and what we can do at the Rosalind Franklin is we can use very, very advanced microscopes to look at the exact atomic structure um, of the nanobody bound to the spike so that we can really understand, okay, it's sticking really well there. What does that, what does that mean for the amino acid sequence of the protein? How can we make it stronger? How can we make it better? So we now have um, a nanobody agent that is uh, curative. So it works beautifully well in animal studies. Um, it completely cures COVID uh, in those animals. They get better in a very short space of time. Um, and really excitingly, you don't have to give it as a, an injected therapy. So you don't have to deliver it straight into the bloodstream. Um, you can deliver it as a nasal spray. So a quick sniff, the nanobody goes into the bloodstream, does its job, mops up the virus, kills the virus. So really exciting. Obviously, you can't overstate these things because it needs to get into humans next. And we've got a lot of work to do. Um, but in terms of how drugs work, it's a, it's a good a good candidate. That's really exciting. So that's the next stage then, is it, is yeah, human right. clinical trials. Um, right. How long would those tend to take? You know, when might we do so, this sort of thing on the market? That is a, a, a million dollar question, yeah. isn't it? So as an imaging institute, so we're basic research, our interest in nanobodies has never been in, in the therapeutic space. We don't make drugs, we're not a pharmaceutical mm -hmm. company. So we're partnering with, um, with someone else to do that next phase and we are hopeful that we'll see that um, move into the next phase in the next few months but need to keep everything crossed. Yeah very exciting. How did we first discover that llamas had this different way of immune, their immune system working? Do you know that that is a story that I would love to know the answer <laughs> to as well so, so they have been known about yeah. since um, since 1993 like I said yeah. um, different camelids have different proportions so some some yeah. antibodies in the llama look a bit more like this um, others are the tiny nanobodies that we're interested in they have different percentages so camels have a different percentage of nanobody to large antibody to alpaca who has a different percentage to llama we don't actually know what the evolutionary advantage of that is so we, we don't know why their immune systems have come up with this this solution it must be a solution to a problem because that's how evolution works um, but yeah, we're not sure what it is. But we're very glad that they do because they're very useful. So. Definitely. So there could be lots of other animals out there whose immune systems work in, in other ways, like the llamas that That's might be out right. there. That's absolutely you, got, you also find nanobodies in sharks, but from a uh, husbandry perspective, I'd say llama were the, the better mm -hmm. candidate to work with. A bit more dangerous with. to yeah, keep yeah. those in South Oxfordshire for a Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. So for, for you then, in terms of the teams that you work with, you're based working on the, the sort of molecular side of mm -hmm. this, you know, the very, That's very right. zoomed in, working out what, what the atoms are doing inside these materials. Um, what other types of scientists do you work with? Um, so at the Rosalind Franklin Institute, we were, we were born as a technology institute. Mm -hmm. So we're there to make the next generation of microscope, the next generation of tools that will help us see further into cells, see, see life in a new way. Um, the nanobody work actually is part of that. So uh, nanobodies are used as a tool to stabilize proteins when we're imaging them to help hold them still. Or the, it, it, It's a general rule that the more interesting a target, the harder it is to look at. So that tends to be because very, very interesting proteins doing really important jobs. Um, they're often based in the membrane of the cell, which means that they they, they have complicated moving parts, so we often just need to hold them still while we, uh, while we image them. And nanobodies were used as a tool in that. Uh, but we work with all kinds of scientists. We work with physicists and um, computer specialists to build detectors and build new microscopes. We work with people like clinicians to bring us um, new interesting research problems to apply to our microscopes and our technologies. So it is a, um, a very interdisciplinary place to be. Yeah, definitely. And so let's hope not but maybe one day a similar type virus will come along that's different from covid mm -hmm. and we will again science will have to come together and react to that very very quickly will your type of work be able to sort of learn from what you've done with yeah. this type of disease and in the future produce something maybe quite quickly to yeah. be able to tackle that yes yeah, so that's a really important next step for us so so the covid work is incredibly important but it it makes far more sense to pursue that as a 
um, as a pipeline that we can apply to new emerging threats yeah. to uh, or even to existing viruses because it's, it's, it's really important to know that there's there's hardly any therapies against viral disease so we can vaccinate and that's a we've seen the importance of vaccination as a tool um, but vaccination isn't for everyone there are there will always be some groups who can't be vaccinated for medical reasons or where vaccines are hard to deliver out into communities in low and middle income countries um, so having a therapy that works is really important so we're we're hoping that um, our nanobody tools will form part of a hundred day challenge so the g7 met um, after well, during the the covid pandemic and they set the challenge of okay for the next time this happens and it will happen again yeah. 100 days is the target. You need to get therapies and vaccines out within the first 100 days to, to stop pandemic situations occurring. Um, and we think tools like this could be really important in that 100 day challenge. Super impressive and very exciting stuff. Laura, Fa Laura Holland from the Rosalind Franklin Institute, thank you so much thank for joining you. me. We're now going to talk to the Young Researchers Zone. So the Young Researchers Zone, for the very first time actually at the Royal Society Summer Exhibition, has featured um, students from schools across the country who are all running research projects as part of the Royal Society's Partnership Grant Scheme. This week, more than 180 students have been here in the building at the Royal Society demonstrating their projects to the public in lots of new and creative ways. <laughs> So our topic is, are we excusing the role of medical polymers in the plastic pollution crisis? So um, medical plastics and disposal plastics are a real problem in today's society. So there are lots of plastics used in hospitals, syringes, needles, masks, stuff like that. And it's actually quite difficult to dispose of them. Most hospitals burn them away using incinerators, but obviously that pollutes the environment. and really isn't the best solution. So we did our research into uh, contact lenses. Now the problem with contact lenses is the hydrocarbon gels that are patented by big companies. So it's actually quite difficult to understand what's going on inside them and how we aim to dispose of them. So what we've decided to do, we went through a bunch of different possibilities and ways. So we initially tried burning them, we tried soaking them in water, but obviously that didn't work. And then we came to this, we found a way using alcohol hand gels to actually break them down and we're hoping to go for a spectroscopy in the University of Liverpool to find out what's actually happening molecularly. We also set up this board here where we do a sort of dot survey to see what many people think about like this pollution. So the question in the middle, how should we deal with uh, medical plastic waste use? As you can see we have a load of different answers. So first, burn it. So we put it in an incinerator, get rid of it chemically. Problem is it releases greenhouse gases into the environment. It can be very bad for our environment, as we know, because of climate change and everything like that. The second way is to find ways to help it decompose, which is what we've actually explored our project into. Now, the problem with this is there are many different types of plastics, and it's actually quite hard to find an easy way to make them decompose that's not very industrialised. Another way is to recycle it, which uh, many people have done, but the problem is some plastics aren't recyclable, so it's not very practical. And then our final way to prevent this is to use less of them, but the problem with today's society is they're not willing to really regress and go back and stop using things that have already been established as good things to use for convenience-wise. And uh, that's basically our project. So we're studying uh, the genomics from a chloroplast genome from two different cultivars of daffodils and we're trying to see how different they are because one's uh, called Ornatus and the other one is called Empress and they obviously look very different so we hypothesize that they are going to have some differences in their genomic sequence um, and also the fact that they come from two different countries one of them comes from England and the other comes from France so how we figured out the, their genomic sequences was manually um, ground up the frozen daffodil leaves and then we used a bunch of buffers and things to chemically break open the cell wall so that we could really access the chloroplast and the DNA. 
once we got the purified extracted DNA sample, we cut it into fragments. This is a minion and it is Oxford Nanopore technology. Um, there's a current running through the nanopores and each base of DNA, there's four different bases, disturbs the current by a different amount and the computer knows by how much each base disturbs the current. So we get a reading like this, it's quite disturbed, but then the, uh, the computer knows which base is which and it de deciphers the current like this. So based off our research, we created a little kind of competition using the pipettes which you use in the DNA extraction. So we have three levels, you have the easy, medium and hard. And we time you and you have to try and recreate the pictures in these multi-well trays. So if I were to make, let's say, I'll do the hard one, I'll do the hard one. It is a competition though, so you do it a lot faster, and then we put the top times on our leaderboards. Oh, yeah, we got Brian Cox. So our focus was data logging, and we're really interested to see how we can use data logging to improve a plane and the model of a plane. Um, so what we did is we took these uh, devices that micro bits. Now, what we use these for is that we put these inside the planes as we throw them and it means that we can actually see what planes work best, how far they fly and what issues might be going on. We actually had 30 different plane models and we fitted these micro bits inside and um, we threw them across the classroom and we were able to figure out what the best design for a plane was and how it could fly easily we've by also, using this data. We've also um, tried more drastic conditions, so we've done it in high wind, we've done it in sort of unreliable winds and it, we're using it to test out different planes and effectively work out what the best plane for which situation is. Our inspiration for this was the um, Boeing 737 MAX flights. They added in an onboard AI, artificial intelligence, to allow them to be flown. And the AI was basically programmed to, you know, save as much fuel as possible. So it does a dip here, that's its plan. It will do a dip here, that will save a lot of fuel, and it will be much more eco-efficient. And you can see, as the pilot was effectively, he was convinced that the AI had gone wrong, he was convinced it was going to crash, so he was trying to protect the people on his plane by keeping it upwards. And as the plane tries to correct itself, because it, at this point it thinks it should be down here, he wrenches away the controls and pretty much panics, um, taking the plane up to a height so much and so fast that it stalls. And as you can see, it begins to plummet back down. And by the time that they're you know, trying to regain control, it's too late, they're moving too fast. And unfortunately, regrettably, they do crash. It really is this data we're using and data logging is the future and it will save so many lives in the future, not only for flights, but in every aspect. And it's really important that young people get involved because we do have access to things like these micro bits, which are only 15 pounds online and you can code it online when we are able to simulate this sort of thing in a simple model so you can see it is sensitive to movement and you can see the path of this micro bit. Our entire medical system really relies on antibiotics. This would be the biggest health crisis that we've experienced this century. We don't hear about it, but it's already here. Nobody is safe until we're all safe. What would a world without antibiotics look like? Well, I think it would look a lot like the past, where a lot of people would die younger than they do now. Just think about war. More people died of infections and their wounds than died actually on the battlefield. Here, a man has locked his heaviest artillery against premature death. Hands-eye biotics. 
the discovery of various classes of antibiotics in the 20th century had a profound impact on healthcare. So treatment of infection suddenly became very straightforward and it's something that we benefit a lot from today. Antibiotics protect people during operative surgery, cesarean sections, replacement joints, let alone cancer treatments. Antibiotics added on average 20 years life to everyone. went to the hospital, the emergency room. They said they gave him a broad spectrum antibiotic. And then they took me to another room and they're like, your son has an infection, we don't know the source. We were in the ICU with like 10 doctors and they said he wasn't really gonna make it. I, at that point, I, I, I knew that he was dead, I, I could feel it and, and that's when we learned that Simon had contracted an antibiotic resistant bacterium, a superbug, and I had never heard of any of this. Use penicillin today. An English physician, Dr. Alexander Fleming. Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin was immense, noticing that in a petri dish where bacteria were growing, there were white areas where the bacteria were not growing. And he realized that something had happened. He looked and found the fungus penicillin, our first effective antibiotic that saved masses of lives. Most antibiotics come from soil and fungi. When I expose bacteria to antibiotics, they're going to become resistant, which is very bad because we haven't discovered a new antibiotic in like the last 30 years. Growing up back in Mexico, you didn't need a prescription to get an antibiotic. You had a little bit of a sore throat, you go to the pharmacy and get an antibiotic. And that only gives more and more chances to these bugs to acquire mutations to become resistant. The time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there is a danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to the non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. The situation uh, today is more serious than people realise. It's actually the first real study looking at all the data, 494 million patient records to model what is happening. It is predicted that by 2050, 10 million people are gonna die every year from complications with superbugs or resistant microbes. So we really have to find alternative strategies to find against these bugs. A world without antibiotics, I sometimes call it the post-antibiotic apocalypse, would impact on our food chain too, because animals would get ill, plants would get ill and die. We would really be in the most dreadful mess. As an individual, I think one of the most important things is don't ask for antibiotics if they're not offered to you. If you are prescribed antibiotics, then make sure you finish the course of antibiotics that you're given, because if you don't finish the course, even if you're feeling better, there might be some residual infection that could become resistant. We have probably found the easy to find antibiotics, but that doesn't mean there are not many more to be found. If we keep recycling the same old treatments, then the problem is just going to exacerbate. One of the main bottlenecks with antibiotic research is that the easiest thing to do is to look at the structures of existing antibiotics and modify those slightly to try to overcome the resistance. It's much more challenging to find a completely new class of antibiotics, so we have to fund 
quite widely in order to be able to, to identify those strategies that are going to work best. I think if there were more awareness, then there would be more general pressure from society on governments and on companies to fund more research into targeting this problem. We should be anticipating problems and doing something about them before they become enormous global crises. Humanity's addiction to fossil fuels has to end. We all know that. But the problem of how to power our lives without them is one of the biggest challenges scientists face today. I'm on my way to meet an expert who may have found a solution. Hi, I'm Esme, nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Nick. So what's brought us here today? Behind us, we actually have the Tate Modern. Now the Tate, before it was an art gallery, actually used to be a power station, supplying energy across the city and the country. And at the UK AEA, we are trying to develop this new energy source called fusion energy. I've heard of fusion and I've heard people get really excited about it, but what actually is it? Fusion is the process that powers the sun and in fact it powers all stars. Right inside the centre of our sun you get atoms made of nuclei and it's the nuclei of small light elements that come together under extreme conditions inside the centre of the sun and when they're under the pressure of those extreme conditions, they can actually get so hot and so energetic that they fuse together. And that fusion is actually what produces the energy for the sun to create its heat and light. I hear you have a demonstration for me. Yeah, I certainly do. Shall we go and check it out? Yes, please. All right. So you're trying to create the conditions of the sun here on Earth. How is that even possible? Yeah, it does sound quite a challenge, uh, and it is. Uh, and we need to create some very extreme conditions, and we need to create a plasma inside our machines. And what is plasma? Plasma is actually what we have here inside our plasma ball. Now, it's quite hard to see, and that's because we've been blessed with some bright sunshine today. <laughs> plasma is actually just the fourth state of matter. We all know about solids, and you can heat those up, melt them into a liquid, and then you heat up a liquid, boils and evaporates into a gas. But then when you heat a gas, it can actually get super hot and ionise into plasma. At our fusion site in Oxfordshire, we put in our hot hydrogen gas until it turns into a plasma, and then we can control all of that hot plasma with powerful magnets. It all sounds very clever. How far have you got with fusion? So we've actually come quite far. Not long ago, our jet machine achieved a world record for fusion energy output. We proved that you can actually produce a high level of fusion energy for a sustained amount of time. And that's a really crucial thing for us to be able to prove that we can do it over a small amount of time now, and then we'll make it happen over a much longer amount of time when we scale it up to power plants. Amazing. And tell me about the research you're bringing to the Summer Science Exhibition. One of the key challenges in fusion is actually dealing with high heat loads. So around the edges of the machine, we have to develop materials that can withstand some uh, level of heat. And we also are trying to reduce that heat load using what's called a diverter, where we can actually steer the plasma down into these exhaust channels and help us to get rid of some of the excess heat and also get rid of some byproducts that might have built up helping us to make a more efficient, stable plasma, and meaning we don't need to repair and to replace parts of the fusion machines when we make power stations out of this stuff. How far away are we from seeing fusion power plants here on Earth? We hope that we're not actually that far away. We're moving into what we call the delivery era, where now our focus is on trying to develop the full-scale fusion power plants of the future. One of our main projects we're working on right now is called STEP. And this is actually a UK design for a prototype fusion power plant in this country. And STEP is aiming to be on the grid by 2040. So really not that long a way to wait. And we're really excited about the STEP project. Incredible. Well, there you go. Harnessing the power of the sun here on Earth could give us sustainable energy in the future. The ocean covers over 70% of our planet, and yet what we know about it barely scratches the surface. 
Beneath its swell is a largely unexplored universe, until recently beyond the gaze of human eyes. So why do we know so little about the ocean? For a start, immense pressure presents huge challenges for divers and equipment alike. In many ways, it's easier to send a mission to space. But with new technology, such as submarine robots, this hidden realm is starting to reveal its secrets. So what's down there? Well, there's water, lots of it. 1,419,120,000 cubic kilometers, to be about as precise as you can be. And in that water, there's fish, the main source of protein for around 3 billion people. But there's a lot more than just fish down there. Extraordinary otherworldly creatures dwell in the depths, with new ones discovered all the time. Many are gelatinous, jellyfish that disintegrate if you try to catch them in a net. In 2020, scientists found the giant siphonophore apolemia, an organism made up of millions of interconnected clones, its thin, twisting body reminiscent of a long piece of string. And the ocean floor is far from being the flat and featureless seabed you might imagine. If you were to drain the ocean, the landscape would emerge just as spectacular as anything on land, boasting some of the highest peaks, deepest canyons, and longest river channels on the planet. There are even waterfalls under the sea, the largest being the Denmark Strait Cataract. Here, the cold waters of the Greenland Sea meet the warmer waters of the Irminger. As the cooler water is forced down, it creates a giant three and a half thousand meter drop, undetectable to anyone who might be bobbing about on the surface. And that's nothing compared to the chilling 11,000 meter drop to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest place on Earth. It was here that in 2020, scientists made an alarming discovery. At a depth of around 7,000 meters, in one of the most remote and inaccessible crevices on Earth, they came across a new species of crustacean, and it had plastic in its stomach. They called it Eurythines plasticus, a living reminder that even though we've barely begun to explore the ocean, our impact on it is already being keenly felt. In fact, by 2050, it's estimated there could be more plastic in the sea than fish. But it's not just plastic that's a problem. There are also dead zones, areas with insufficient oxygen to support marine life. These are becoming more common thanks to pollution. The sad truth is, when it comes to the ocean, the reach of human activity goes far beyond the reach of our knowledge. It's easy to feel detached from the ocean, particularly if you live inland. And this might explain why we've treated it as a dumping ground. But the more we explore, the more we find it has to offer. For example, the gene pool of deep ocean life, such as sponges and microorganisms, could hold the key to solving the urgent problem of antibiotic resistance. More importantly, the ocean is key to almost all life on the planet. Half the oxygen we breathe comes from marine photosynthesizers, such as phytoplankton and seaweed. The ocean also regulates our climate, mediating temperature by distributing solar heat around the planet. We may not feel it, but every one of us is affected every day by the role the ocean plays in our finely balanced Earth system. And yet, the efforts we've made so far to protect and preserve this vital life source are, well, a drop in the ocean. There's still so much we don't know, so many breathtaking canyons unseen, so many creatures undiscovered, but new technology is revealing more about our ocean than ever before. Perhaps if we knew more of the ocean's secrets, we might look after it better. and welcome back to Summer Science Live here from the Royal Society Summer Exhibition. We're here all afternoon talking to some of our amazing scientists at the exhibit about their research and what they've brought to the Summer Science Live exhibition. So I'm joined here on the sofa with Dr Nick Aldred and Dr Anna Sturrock, both from the University of Essex. Um, and you've brought an exhibit all about ocean travellers. So tell me, what animals can we study in the ocean and what can they tell us about the world. OK, 
kick that off, I suppose, we're the Ocean Traveller exhibit. So what we're trying to do is introduce people to movement of all things in the ocean. Mm -hmm. We think people are probably reasonably familiar with movement of the big things, the whales, sea turtles, schools of fish, these types of things. And they know that human activity can affect those, often negatively. Mm. We think they're less familiar with the really tiny things. And they're equally important, arguably more important, because they're at the basis of um, ocean ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So on our exhibit, we have all, the, all of the things from the very tiniest all the way up to the, uh, the, the biggest. And what can these ocean, ocean travellers tell us about what's going on in the oceans? So, yeah, I mean, we've got, some, uh, we've got a whole mixture of things, but some of them are just going from the very small things like diatoms, and then movements within the kind of estuarine muds. And we don't really think about those movements, but they're happening every single mm. day. And they're really important in terms of carbon sequestration and oxygen production. So about 20% of all the oxygen we breathe is based, made by diatoms. Wow. We've also got barnacles, like these ones just here. And so there are some really important practical applications yeah. of this. I mean, not many people realise that 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from shipping. So mm. that's about the same as Germany okay. on, an, on an annual basis, <laughs> for some yeah. context. So even a 1% efficiency in increase on the hull of a ship can be yeah. really important for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So you don't want barnacles ah, growing all producing over, fi growing friction. Up, yeah, yeah. Growing all over your ship producing drag. So although yeah. barnacles don't move as adults, that we move them around the world's oceans. Sure. They can become invasive and they can cause problems on the hulls of ships. They also have planktonic larvae that they use as a dispersal, because if things can't move as adults, they still need to be able to disperse somehow. Mm -hmm. And they do that by releasing larvae, and they're very selective about where they go to. So my research began being interested in how selective these larvae are about where they go, and it's ended up studying the least selective, which are the ones that grow uh, all over ships. Mm, OK. So. so once we understand why they grow and how they grow, then the idea would be to try and stop them from growing, them so from growing. to make those ships more efficient and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're still using coatings to prevent biofouling that are similar to those that were being used 100 years ago. Okay. So we're trying to produce more, and they're, they're very toxic. They're heavy metal based. All of that ends up in the ocean. Okay. So uh, there are many facets to this. We're trying yeah. to produce um, overall a, a net environmental benefit. Yeah, what sort of materials, what are these anti-fouling coatings made out of? So 90% of anti-fouling coatings on ships that you see moving around the oceans are uh, copper based. So they contain heavy metals, copper is the most common one, and that's there just to kill um, marine organisms that might settle there. And they're designed to pollute. So they're designed to degrade and all of that copper ends up in the ocean. So those are the kinds of technologies we're looking to replace, but they have to work. Because if they don't work, we have another problem, which is growth all over ships, more greenhouse gas emissions, the global supply chains suffer, and we transport invasive species around the oceans. Yeah, okay. So, Nick, your research is about the very, very small organisms, and I know your research is looking at larger organisms. So how do we actually study the movements of bigger organisms in the ocean? Great question. <laughs> I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my research primarily uses a mixture of tags attached to the animals mm -hmm. or natural tags within the tissues of the animals and so traditionally we would just do things like mark recapture so it might be just a little, little number that you've kind of basically attached to the animal and then you get where you released it and where someone recalled it if, if they if they ring you up and let you know the number then they kind of evolved to these data storage tags just like this one this was a very early tag made by CFAS and this was attached to a North Sea place uh, around stuck onto its body with thick glue and it told us the temperature and pressure and so you can get their movement patterns from something like this I and they're it evolving it was a big place so I think <laughs> it'd be hard pressed to find a place big enough to put this on now unfortunately um, they've evolved a lot since then and they're now quite streamlined and we've also got tags that were used on tuna to look at their movement patterns and then we're also really highlighting some great work by a company called Osearch, where it's not this tag, but a tag like this. They'll put it on the dorsal fin of the shark. So we're showing great white sharks and uh, whale shark movements. And when they kind of come up from the surface, they'll dry out. And as they dry out, they'll ping up to a satellite. So the great thing about those tags is you don't need to recapture the, the animal to get the information back. So we get loads of information from them, but you can see the size of it. Feel how heavy it is. You can't put something like that on a baby fish. No, you couldn't. It would just sink. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so baby fish, actually most of our fish uh, die when in those very early life stages. And so if we want to try and make more fish that we can catch to eat, mm. we really want to protect them. 
And so to understand which nursery habitats are most important, I use, you won't be able to see them on camera, but it's called an otolith, it's an ear stone of a fish. I also use eye lenses because what happens, they grow in layers, like until you get tree trunk rings effectively in them. Wow. And then what we can do is we can look at the chemistry in each of those layers to work out where it was from, basically a chemical tracker and what it ate. So I use that to say, okay, this nursery habitat is very important, let's protect it. Wow, that's <laughs> fascinating. I want to ask you another question about those sort of, I guess, GPS type trackers and mm -hmm. um, sort of location trackers. Why can't we track, why do they have to dry out above the water? Why can't we track all of their movements when they're under the water? That's a really good question and to be completely honest I'm not quite sure but I believe that the, the, they need to, in order to ping they need to be above the surface. Yeah. So if a species lives under the water only mm -hmm. you need different methods and so sometimes you might use something like this where you need to recapture it. Other times they'll use kind of acoustic tags or kind of blue te Bluetooth technology right. but those ones you need an array of receivers around the ocean to be able to receive that information when the fish goes past it. So depending on the species we'll use a different type of tag. Yeah. And of course there are things we can't track at all yeah. like the large of marine invertebrates. Yeah. So things like coral larvae, mm. there's been lots of progress in understanding coral reef ecology and we want to preserve coral reefs, restore coral reefs. What we don't understand very much about at all is how the larvae of corals return to coral reefs and produce new corals. So there are enormous gaps in our, in our mm. knowledge of the ecology of these things that can be improved by understanding movement of, of all of these things around the oceans. And I will say with that, one of the best things we can do is combine these techniques. So mm. geneticists come together with chemical trackers, with kind of, kind of electronic trackers and, and oceanographic modelling. That's mm. really when the magic happens. Sure. <laughs> So we've heard about benefits to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and protecting f important fisheries. What other sort of industries or areas can this sort of research touch on? I could go first. I suppose I'm, uh, my core research for a long time was actually understanding adhesion. Mm. So it's understanding how things like barnacles actually stick to surfaces, what the materials are that they've evolved over the course of millions of years to stick to all kinds of surfaces. One of the challenges with preventing biofouling is that these things have had a lot of practice. I mean, <laughs> they've, been, they've been attacked, there's been an arms race going on for millions of years with animals often that are trying to keep themselves clean trying to prevent the settlement of, of barnacles and barnacles trying to develop glues that outwit those animals. Right. So they're highly optimized and they're mainly protein based. So the glue of a barnacle is about 90% proteins. So we can do interesting biochemistry with those, understand how they work. And if we can develop synthetic versions, we can do things like produce glues that work underwater, that work in the human body, where the environment is very similar to the sea, it's salty. Um, sure. It's got high ionic, ionic potential, so yeah, there's lots of potential there. Wow, so medical uses as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just add that one of the good things about these kind of chemical traces, they also record water temperature on that animal effectively, and so then we can start understanding. And actually, a lot of these trackers do as well. They'll also record temperature, and so now we can start understanding what temperatures they prefer or can tolerate. So then we can predict how kind of um, movements going to uh, species are going to shift in their distributions in a future climate. So you've both been at the Summer Science Exhibition now for a few days talking yeah. to the public about your research. What sort of questions have they been asking you? You know, what are the, what are the public thinking about this? Well, some of the, some of the, a lot of the people seem to really like our game. We've got a game called the Maze of Misfortune, yeah. uh, where we've got like a salmon, a, t a turtle and a narwhal, and you've got to try and get them successfully around the maze and avoid being eaten. So there's been a, a few questions about, I want more levels. Um, Download the Maze of Misfortune, guys. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, we've also had some... Available on Google Play. <laughs> yes, very Great plug. plug. Great plug, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professional right there. Um, I've had some really interesting questions about... Um, um, you know, where barnacles stick to, turns out some of them stick to sharks' butts, which I thought was quite cool and I didn't know that before, so... <laughs> barnacles stick all over the... the but feeding time at the barnacle enclosure has been the highlight. I mean, if I'd known, if I'd known that barnacles were going to be so attractive, I'd have gone on the road with them years ago. Yeah. But bringing it back to seriousness, actually one thing I did want to say was, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, was, uh, was one of the questions, well why does it matter if we know about these behaviours of these big animals, it's cool, sure, but what, what does it matter? And so part of it's just public outreach and get people excited about it, There's, so us, O-Search have got this app so you can track your favourite shark or whatever if you want to, but one of the things that I find really striking is that we see that this intraspecific, so within species diversity is super important, so 
the loss of that diversity has been likened to the hidden biodiversity crisis because we focus so much on when a species goes extinct but we're not really we don't really often really understand when we're losing these behaviors and this variation within species so that's something i'm very passionate about and we're only starting to get the uh, tools to look at that really now Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really lovely to chat to you about your research. Dr. Nick Aldred and Dr. Hannah Sturrock from the University of Essex. Best of luck going forward. I can't wait to see what you come up with next. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Cheers. Don't forget you can ask your questions to our researchers on the um, Slido, which is slido.com and enter SSE22. Um, on there you'll be able to ask our researchers your questions, which I can then put to them in the studio. So get asking your questions um, and I'll be putting them to our researchers. I'm now joined on the sofa um, by researchers from, the, from University College London. So welcome. Um, who, who are you and what are you uh, exhibiting today? Well, uh, I'm Professor Tamar Makin. Uh, we're actually uh, now in Cambridge University, mm -hmm. MSc Cognition Brain Unit. Uh, and uh, together with Danny, who's been my collaborator for the last four years, uh, we run re research on augmentation. So motor augmentation aims to enhance people's bodies, um, passing, suppressing beyond the flesh and blood limitations uh, that we were born with in order to allow people to do more with their bodies. And uh, Danny, who would introduce herself with his little yep. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I'm Danny Claude. Um, I'm a designer. And I designed uh, the third thumb, uh, which is a um, 3D printed uh, augmentation device for the hand. Uh, it's controlled with the toes. I don't know if you guys can see. <laughs> so I've got pressure sensors underneath my big toes. And I'm doing the two degrees of freedom of the third thumb. Um, the third thumb was. Um, my graduate work from my master's at the Royal College of Art, uh -huh. um, where I made my first prototype. I'm now probably on prototype 350. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and started collaborating uh, with Tamar uh, after she saw it on online, actually. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> wow, what a cool collaboration. So, so tell us more about how it works then. So you've got... <coughs> your thumb, it, your your toe is what's controlling it. Yes, yes. So I've got little pressure sensors um, underneath my big toes, inside my shoes, um, and this uh, speaks to these uh, kind of little ch computer chips uh, around my ankles, which then wire wirelessly connects to up here. Yep. And this is all just battery packs because batteries are the, the challenging uh, big big devices. Yeah. Um, and then that's connected to uh, the motors on the wrist, which is controlling um, the third thumb. But yeah, design everything myself and 3D print everything. Um, so we're actually on our stand. We've got our 3D printer um, that I print all the thumbs. Sort of. Great, amazing. So why did you want to come up with something like this? What was the inspiration? Um, yeah, so I, I designed prosthetic arms as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I work with the Alternative Limb Project also. And um, I really wanted to understand what it was like to you know, I want to investigate the relationship that forms between um, the wearer and a prosthesis. Mm. Um, it's a really unique product um, and, uh, and this kind of really f unique relationship forms. Um, and I wanted to experience it for myself. So I very much just wanted to try it out for myself first mm. um, for my master's project. And then um, I didn't realize how much uh, of an impact it could have uh, in neuroscience research. Yeah. So pr prostheses then are, you know, um, either robotic or kind of um, non-electronic devices or items that we have on our bodies that represent a kind of a, a new limb or a replacement limb, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got, um, I mean, the two kind of main areas, I guess, are congenital one-handers, so people born with one arm uh, or no arms, um, or people who have suffered a loss of an arm. Mm -hmm. um, and those are very different kind of people to design prosthet prosthetics for. And we actually research them in the lab as well. Yeah. So how does your research sort of interact with, with yours? Um, so... When I first met Danny, um, I got a great big, you know, funding uh, grant yeah. in order to um, explore what happens to um, the human brain when we start uh, controlling a body part we've never had before, because there's very rich, complicated questions. Um, for example, if you use your toes in order to control um, a third thumb together with your hand, is your toe going to become more like a hand? Mm -hmm. And then if you need to use it again, it's like a toe, for example, when you're walking home, are you going to be a bit more clumsy? So there's lots of questions about how the brain adapts to controlling this new body part and how it finds a way to do it very efficiently. Uh, and we, with that question in mind, I was looking for a collaborator. Uh, and for me, as a neuroscientist, I wanted a technology that is very versatile, so people could do whatever they want with it, not just what we can do in the lab. And really important for me that people can take it home with them and use it throughout the day. And the uh, only uh, technology that was at that level of versatile readiness was coming from Danny. Amazing. So what sort of um, 
findings have you observed then in terms of how people's brains adapt to having, in this case, a third thumb? So we've learned so much since starting to work with Danny. One really important result for us is that if you use your thumb, Danny can demonstrate, if you use your thumb together with your hand, you can grasp objects with various um, fingers and configurations uh, and that means that you're changing radically the way you use your own hand in daily life mm -hmm. and we found that this has direct impact on how the brain represents the hand because you're radically changing the way you use your hand. Um, in other studies we were trying to understand how the brain learns to create this collaboration between the toes and the hand and we've learned that it comes up with really creative ways to substitute the information kind of in this gap between the feet and the hand. We're running a lot of research with fMRI to look at how the brain responds and here we're really lucky because Danny has designed for us a thumb that is MRI safe so we actually put people in the scanner and see how they control the thumb. If it's the first time they control it, if they control it after they've learned to use it and become experts. And how long does that learning take? So this is what we're studying yeah. in the Royal Society uh, <coughs> in this week. So we set yeah. up a little challenge, oh, wow. uh, which is um, can anyone learn to use the thumb within one minute or less? We've got two sizes. We've got, I've, I've made some kid-sized ones as well, especially for the Royal Society. Yeah, awesome. and, we're, and we've got some adult ones as well. Yeah. So, so far we looked at, I think, 400 uh, visitors. Yeah. Uh, and only three out of the 400 was unable to learn to use the thumb within a minute. Wow, gosh. So will you take that data and, you know, make that scientific and kind of publish yes. this research? Absolutely. And this is where, the, this is where uh, we really get to benefit from the Royal Society, not just by exposing people to our ideas and, you know, and, and the importance of this technology and introducing people to this really novel uh, uh, technology and consequences on the brain, but we can also get a little something back for the scientific community. Yeah, absolutely. So what have some of the public's reactions been to suddenly having an extra thumb? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's been good. I mean, the, the reactions are always, are always quite uh, quite fun um, and uh, yeah it's, it's always the the little kids that are really kind of like not not quite sure it's at, at the start but then absolutely love it by the end um, and uh, yeah I mean we've had lots of questions we've also got a 3d printer printing um, and yeah everyone picks it up so well and yeah really enjoying it which is great yeah awesome what sort of questions have people asked you um, yeah, I've just I've, I've kind of been more about the, by the three D printer, oh, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I can't think of any off, off the top of my head. So for for us, uh, people are really keen to understand if we want to control the thumb directly with our thoughts, with the brain. Mm, sure. Yes. Yeah. And to this, I say. I really don't, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because uh, if we want to create invasive technology, uh, we need to first get into the brain, yeah. because uh, unfortunately the technology that we have right now that is non-invasive just doesn't pick up enough information, yes. uh, and I'm really not keen to cut people open. Yeah. And what's more, I think there's so much more we can do with our bodies mm -hmm that we're not exploiting for technologies such as rehabilitation technologies that I think we need to, uh, w we have a lot more to explore before we need to give up and go into invasive solutions. So I for one am really excited to tell them uh, your brain control your trolls, yeah. so therefore the brain <laughs> controls the thumb. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. just going via the toes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what, are you, what is your hope then for this research for the third thumb? What are you hoping to achieve? Um, well, we're, um, co I've taken it to um, a couple of different conferences. Um, one uh, in particular was, was REACH, uh, which is kids with upper limb difference. So I um, actually kind of um, gave a third thumb to uh, so lots of different kids with different kinds of hands. Um, it kind of helped extend their, the functionality of their hand to working perhaps with patient groups like that. Um, we're also um, excited to perhaps explore uh, stroke patients as well in terms of either augmenting their, their hand that they have the best control over or additionally help with rehabil rehabilitation in terms of the control of the thumb as well. Also um, temporary um, immobilization such as breaking a wrist. Um, you know we have uh, options for kind of augmentation like crutches when you break an ankle but when you break a wrist there's not so many options. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're excited um, you know especially with all this research we're getting that it's so easy to pick up so quickly. Um, it'd be great for kind of those temporary groups as well. Yeah. And in terms of the hardware, you mentioned this is, 
you know, one iteration of the prototype that you've been developing <laughs> over a long period of time. What are the challenges in terms of creating something like this? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I sp I've spoken to a couple of my uh, roboticist friends, and, and it is, uh, you know, even if you're working on something like this, um, which is kind of on the low end, because it's it, as in terms of um, money, because I'm 3D printing everything I set myself, but as opposed to, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of um, robotics engineering, um, we still suffer with the same problems, which is kind of motor strength over size, battery power and size, and especially wearable um, components as well. Everything has to be external to the body, as opposed to uh, with a you know, prosthetic arm designs, you get to kind of hide everything uh, within kind of this area, which is usually used, uh, not is kind of empty. As a, you know, we've got the socket here, then the hand, and then there's kind of more space uh, internally. Um, so augmentation and wearable technology is always so challenging. And then obviously, yeah, kind of making sure the body um, fits everything. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to try a mechanic version? We've just got a little manual one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but right hand, like so. Yep. Perfect. So this is just to give you a sense of how it feels like to have an extra finger. Oh, it's quite so comfy. <laughs> the, the pulleys you have here uh -huh. are ah, to control okay. two so degrees. Yeah, two main degrees of freedom. So it's across the hand and up and down. Yes, got you. Yeah, so it's flexion extension across Give the hand um, and oh. adduction and abduction towards the, towards the finger. So, okay, so that one goes that way and this one goes this way. Amazing. Oh, could you do both at the same time? <laughs> so imagine this would be normally controlled with your toes. Yeah, got you. I'm surprised that people can learn this in a minute. That's very impressive. My goodness. <laughs> it's much easier, much more intuitive with the toes. I oh, really, the mm. brain could sort of un... That's really interesting. Yeah, because at the moment, my, my other hand is involved mm -hmm. in controlling. Doing something very non-intuitive for the hand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it moves really nicely. And, these and try... Oh, sorry, and try uh, meet meet your other fingers as well. So that's kind of one of the, mm -hmm. the main tasks, um, which yeah. is yeah, finger opposition, because we want you to kind of collaborate with yeah. um, with the digits. We find that people, when they first try, they really just want to focus on using the thumb by itself, which yeah. is obviously not something we don't normally do with our fingers. We always kind of work together, yeah, two or three exactly. fingers together, to, to do something. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. It's really nicely made as well. I love these, oh, thank um, you. the the kind of hinges here, really clever. Yes, yeah, so it's all printed in one piece. Wow, yeah, really? Yeah. And it must be quite quick to print then as well. Um, yeah, about kind of eight to ten hours. Very impressive. Yeah, which is quite quick for 3D printing. It yeah, doesn't, yeah, doesn't sound very fast. <laughs> wow, thank you so much for, um, for coming to show us this. Um, yeah, and good luck with your research. I can't wait to see what you come up with next. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, that's us from the studio for now. We're going to a quick break where we're going to um, hear about um, from Professor Sandra Dan from Loughborough University, who is going to talk about how we might move towards a more sustainable future by replacing oil. Unless you've been living under a rock recently, you'll know that we urgently need to end our use of fossil fuels, getting our energy from renewable sources such as solar and wind instead. But we don't just use fossil fuels for energy. Millions and millions of everyday items such as clothing, makeup and phones are made using crude oils. But how can we make these items without digging up fossil fuels from the ground? And what about these mysterious catalysts that turn raw materials into stuff? I'm at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in East London to meet a scientist who's hopefully going to clear this all up for me. Hi, I'm Esby, nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Ariana, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for meeting me here today. Now I have to say, this isn't the first place I think of when I think of a chemical engineer. Well, sports, chemistry and chemical engineering, they do have quite a lot in common and actually that is the energy. So first of all, how much of everything we use contains oil? platform chemicals that we actually get from the crude oil are crucial for us. It's in the materials that we use every single day. When we think about the plastic packaging to medicine, shampoo and also uh, various types of materials. So you need those building blocks and they all come from oil. They are the platform chemicals. Interesting. So if platform chemicals are the building blocks, what are the catalysts? Oh, that's an exciting part. I have a demonstration to show you if you want to follow me. Fantastic. Let's go. So this is Tom. And Tom's part of your demonstration, isn't he? Yes, it? indeed. So we talked about catalysts a little bit earlier on. What exactly is a catalyst then? So more than 85% of materials are actually made with some sort of a catalyst. Catalyst is a chemical helper. It actually helps us to reduce the energy that we need to put in, in the reaction to be able to get the product. So Tom is actually going to demonstrate our energy input and he's going to go and run up the stairs. So Tom, if you want to go and run up the stairs, yeah, sure. please. <laughs> Thank you. 
So what are we seeing in this demonstration? What does Tom represent? So Tom is actually an energy input. When you think about the reaction, you need the reactants at the start. So Tom running up to the top of the stairs, he's putting a lot of energy. And when you're on top of the stairs, because your products have lower energy, him coming down the slide would be the product in the end. There we are, well done. So Tom, how did it feel to be part of a chemical reaction? Yeah, fun. <laughs> So what really happened is that uh, Tom running up the stairs, he has put uh, quite a lot of energy into the reaction. As a second part of this demonstration, we're going to have actually Tom running halfway through, and that would be with the catalyst. OK, so he's going to start halfway up, and then using a catalyst, he can get to the top with half the amount of energy. Indeed. Yeah? So Tom, do you want to head to the lift and get a head start? I'd love to. So how do you feel having done it with a catalyst? Was it a bit easier? That was much easier, yeah. yeah. So hopefully now you understood why the catalyst is so important and why it's very important to get the right catalyst with the platform chemicals that you're using. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for being a great demonstrator. You're very welcome. So where are we going to be getting platform chemicals from in the future and how does it relate to catalysts? At the moment, we are obtaining our platform chemicals from the crude oil. And if we want to move from the crude oil, we have to look for the different sources of our platform chemicals. And that's actually, in our research, is the biomass. It's actually the waste from other farms or even the breweries. So does that mean that the waste from beer could be turned into, like, plastic bottles, say? Hopefully, yes, in the future, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we use the waste as a new way to source those uh, platform chemicals. So we're not going to throw away those uh, materials like uh, biomass in the landfills or the oceans. And having said that, I think it's really important to um, create new types of catalysts and also think about uh, going away from the traditional catalysts. What about the catalysts? So the traditional catalysts, all that the catalysts are doing is actually they're breaking the bonds between the carbons and hydrogens, so something like this. And they're creating a smaller molecules and these molecules in the reaction, they would rearrange uh, and actually create uh, new types of products in the end uh, using less energy. And these kind of like catalysts, if they get into the biomass, biomass is full of uh, different uh, waste and it would end up probably uh, poisoning the catalyst. So we need uh, a new types of uh, catalyst to treat the biomass. Well, this is so interesting. Thank you so much. And I really like the idea of closing the loop and having no more waste. So thank you so much for speaking to me today. Thank you. So next time you throw away a plastic bottle, wash your hands using soap or use a pen, remember that all these products have been made using chemicals transformed with the help of a catalyst. All these products are important to our standard of living and it's the engineers and chemists who ensure we can keep using them without costing the earth. Hello and welcome back to the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition. This is Summer Science Live. I'm Dr Anna Podajski, material scientist, writer and presenter. Um, and all throughout today I'm going to be taking your questions and putting them to our scientific experts here in the studio. You can pose your questions to them on slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. And if you put in the code SSE22 on there, then I'll be able to put your questions to our scientific experts here today. Now, I'm joined here in the studio by Samantha Bell and Catherine Harrison, both from the U University of Manchester. And I understand that you've brought to the Summer Science Exhibition the story of the Winchcombe meteorite. Tell me more. I do. So here is a sample <gasps> of the Winchcombe meteorite. So you're very welcome to hold it. Thank you. Um, so the Winchcombe oh. meteorite fell in February 2021. Um, and we're really lucky that this is one of the most pristine samples that we have, one of the most pristine uh, meteorites it was collected within 12 hours of it falling on the Earth's surface, which is super special for us. Um, so this meteorite is full of uh, water and organic material. So it means it came from a kind of asteroid that might have brought water and organics to Earth. So it's really important for us to study so we can figure out kind of how the Earth is formed in this kind of way. Wow. Yeah. So a rock like this that fell to Earth from space mm -hmm. millions, billions of years ago, 
so it would have formed uh, 4.6 billion years ago. Got, yeah, okay. So it's got some things in it that it's like the oldest thing you'll ever hold in your hand. Wow, but oh my goodness. It fell to Earth about a year and a half ago. It fell to Earth a year and a half ago, but yes. something like this could have been the rock that came and brought life and water to Earth yes. when it originated. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's <laughs> really mind boggling. So, why do we want to study rocks like this now? Well, because it's 4.5. Six billion years yeah. old on Earth. Um, we don't tend to. It's rarer to get rocks that old on Earth that are sort of preserving that far back because we've got things like erosion, plate tectonics, recycling the crust. So these provide like snapshots into the very early solar system that we're just not otherwise able to to investigate. So yeah, they're really important. And this meteorite landed here in the UK, which was pretty lucky as well. <laughs> yeah, so it's the first um, meteorite to fall in the UK for about 30 years. Wow. So it's really, really special. Um, and the biggest reason that we, we knew that it had fallen is because of, uh, we've got a meteor, meteor camera network in the UK. Um, so we've got cameras across the UK that are constantly looking up at the sky, really? ready to track um, the fireballs. So when meteor, meteors come through the atmosphere, they start to burn up and produce a fireball, similar to like a shooting star. Um, and if it's big enough, a bit of it will land on the surface of the Earth. So uh, what we can do is we can use a trajectory of the fireball to work out where the meteorite was going to fall. Um, ah, clever. So we had people that figured out it was most likely going to be uh, in the Winchcombe area, yep. so near, uh, near Cheltenham. So some of my colleagues went on the news and said, if anyone can find anything, like a suspicious black rock, really? please get in touch with us. <laughs> and then we're very lucky that um, Rob and Catherine Wilcock heard this on the news and then they woke up the next morning and on the driveway there was a massive splat of black rock and it was the meteorite and it landed on their driveway oh um, so they got in touch with us and we rushed over and then we found loads of meteorite which is just amazing. Yeah <laughs> and what happens next then so you find this meteorite how do you actually study it? Uh, so <laughs> downstairs we've actually got um, a scanning electron microscope which is one of the techniques that uh, we'll commonly use to sort of identify different minerals within the meteorites, um, but essentially, yeah, that will get cut up into different sections and distributed to several different uh, universities and institutions uh, around the UK are involved in sort of classifying the, the meteorite as the sort of initial steps. And then I'm sure there's lots of interest in science that's yeah. going to be coming in the next few years out of this sample. Mm -hmm. So it's not finders keepers. <laughs> 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 no, so um, Rob and Catherine Wilcock, they donated everything yeah. that they, they found to the museum, which was amazing. Yes. yes, really amazing for the scientists to then study it. Amazing. And tell me about this sample that you're so holding. So yeah, we also brought a bit of a bigger one. Um, so this is an iron meteorite. Ooh, oh, it's heavy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's it's nearly pure iron. It's got a, a very small amount of nickel in it. Um, yeah. And these iron meteorites come from the cores of asteroids. Um, mm -hmm. So just like the Earth's got a, a, a solid metal core, if an asteroid gets big enough, it can separate out and get as all the denser iron will sink in towards the middle and form this core. And then oh. if there's been a collision with between two asteroids, it reaches right into the core, bits of that core get flung off and uh, yeah, some intersect and land on the Earth and we've got a big chunk of one here. Amazing. So this must have been a big chunky one that landed. Yeah, so some of them can be like you know, 20 plus tonnes wow, of material. Wow, you don't want that landing on your house, yeah, do you? No, no. And there's something really interesting here. I'm a material scientist, so I'm nerding out right now because there's some really interesting sort of patterns that are formed um, in the metal of this meteorite. If I remember rightly, these are quite unique, aren't they, to yeah, me so you have meteoric to have iron? Like really um, high pressures to form these sort of, uh, I think it's Vindman statin mm -hmm. patterns. That's right, yeah. yes, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's quite diagnostic of, of these sure. iron meteorites mm -hmm. and, and where they originated from. So, if you did find this in your garden, you could take a slice and look for this, and that would tell you that it was meteoric iron. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So, People at home might be asking themselves, you know, we can study these rocks to, you know, find out what they're made out of um, and sort of think about where they might have come from. What can this tell us about our solar system? So, as I say, specifically with sort of um, meteorites like the, the Winchcombe meteorite, yeah. they're, they're telling us about sort of the first stages of our solar system, like how planets were forming, where the sort of molecules that would eventually um, potentially have brought life to the Earth and, and things like that, where they were um, in the early solar system and what was happening way before even we, you know, we were recording any of that on, in rocks on Earth. So, yeah, yeah a, a unique sort of 
snapshot into the yeah, very what, early solar system. Exactly, what happened and kind of where we came from. So you've been here at the Royal Society Summer Exhibition experiencing it, talking to members of the public. What have they had to say about this? Uh, so they're really, really interested. Um, I think it's such a unique thing being able to see something that's come from space. Um, and it, obviously because it fell in the UK, it's really captured a lot of people's imagination. Um, and also we've got such a range of meteorites on display as well. Um, I think, yeah, people are pretty amazed that they can hold something that's 4.6 billion years old uh, that's come from space and fell in the UK. Kind of yeah, thing. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So what kind of scientists work on this then? Um, so I, I guess a lot of us are geologists, mm -hmm. yep. but um, there's also lots of, of chemists and physicists as well with mm -hmm. different backgrounds coming together. Yeah to look at these meteorites. Um, but yeah, I think we're both a geology perspective. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and what are you hoping to kind of do next? What's next for you guys? Uh, so I guess um, one of the, the biggest things that we're really hoping to do is get more um, camera, cameras out across yeah. the UK. So the more fireballs that we can track, the more meteorites we can hopefully find. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really helped having the Winchcombe meteorite fall has made, um, it's really let the public know that meteorites are findable. Um, so, and uh, also people can um, send in their own videos, so like doorbell cameras and cameras in uh, cars. Um, people can submit all their videos of, of fireballs and we can use all that information to, to work out um, wow. lots of interesting science from it. So. And how many fireballs are there in the UK every year? Is this a rare occurrence? Um, so there's, there's like shooting stars all the time yeah, so I think yeah. we expect um, a meteorite to fall in the UK about once every year I think. Sure, a big enough one that a big would land one that would, and be something you could study. So yeah, yeah. Um, there was a meteorite that potentially fell in Shrewsbury a couple of months ago so we all went out hunting unfortunately we didn't find anything. Um, yeah so we're, we're on track for about one every year I think. Hopefully, yeah, crossed. it's really exciting proof for the Winchcombe that it like it does work mm -hmm. that Definitely. you know we can track yes. these things and go mm -hmm. out and yeah. retrieve them. Fantastic. Oh, thank you so much for talking to me today and good luck with thank everything. You. Samantha Bell and Catherine Harrison from the University of Manchester. We're now going to take a quick break and um, go to a, a piece on, by Jack Monaghan from the Wellcome Sanger Institute, speaking from Kew Gardens to learn more about this immense project charting the diversity of life on Earth called the DNA Tree of Life. Have you ever tried to build your own family tree? If you have, then I'd guess you probably haven't got more than 100 years back, over 200, and I'd be really impressed. Well, the group of scientists I'm about to meet are building their own family tree, except theirs goes back a few billion years, and it's not just humans on it, it's all species in Britain and Ireland. Their project is called the Darwin Tree of Life, and they're decoding the DNA of over 70,000 different life forms trying to understand the history of life and much more along the way. Hello, I'm Esme. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi, Esme. I'm Elia and I work here at Kew Gardens. I'm Ross. I work at the Earlham Institute in Norwich. So, Elia, would you be able to tell me a little bit more about the Darwin Tree of Life and what it is? It's this amazing, ambitious programme. It's all about DNA sequencing, about decoding the genomes of living organisms. And by sequencing all the species in Britain and Ireland, it's going to provide us with this huge wealth of data, provide us a real snapshot of the life on these islands and how they've evolved together. Amazing. Well, you mentioned decoding genomes. Yep. What's the genome? What is a genome? Indeed, it's the full DNA code found in living organisms in each of their cells. And DNA itself, you know, it's made up of four different chemicals that we refer to by the first letter, A, T, C and G. So, for example, if we we're going to take your own genome and take a little bit of it and sequence it, we might see the DNA sequence going T, 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 A, G, G, G or something like that. But our genome, of course, is much larger than that. But to illustrate how large, I brought along, you know, this lovely first copy of Harry Potter, the first book that was produced. And that's got just over 70,000 words. And if we counted all the letters, that's about 350,000 letters. And we might think that's a lot of letters, but in fact, our own genome is made up of 3.5 billion letters. And so that's equivalent to about 10,000 copies of this Harry Potter book. 
If we want to understand what are the different bits of the DNA doing, what we need to be able to do is to compare the DNA sequences between different genomes. So that's where the Darwin Tree of Life comes in, because we're going to generate sequences for all the animals, the plants and the fungi, as well as the protists which live here. But I'm going to leave that to Ross actually to explain these amazing group, the protists. Yeah, Ross, tell me, what is a protist? So yeah, the Darwin Tree of Life project is going to sequence everything in the British Isles. That includes the big stuff you can see, the oak trees, the animals, but also the really, really tiny organisms that you can't see without a microscope. And those are called the protists. Protist is a collective term for any single-celled organism that isn't a plant or an animal or a fungi. And because they're not one group, they're very, very different from each other as well as from us. They're as different from each other as we are from plants, for example. So if you imagine uh, every animal you can think of, all the dogs, people, birds, fish, insects, they all fall on one branch of the tree of life. All of the plants are on another branch and all the fungi and yeast are on another branch. And there are eight other branches with potentially as much diversity as all of the animal kingdom. But in order to access all that information, we have to get the genome sequence. But Erna at the Wellcome Sanger Institute uh, can tell you more about that. Hi Erna, I'm Esme, lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you too. So everything has its own genome sequence, which is microscopically tiny and has millions and millions of letters in it. I want to know how you can possibly read that genome sequence. Yeah, good question. I'll tell you how we go from this sample like a leaf to a full genome sequence. So first we've got collectors in the field who find a species, and like this daisy, and they take a small part of it like this leaf, and they want to get the leaf and the DNA inside of it to us in the best condition possible. So they put it in a tube like this and send it to us frozen in the lab and um, where we need to get the DNA out. So we need to break open the cell, release the DNA and we separate the DNA out from all the rest of the material inside the leaf. Um, so we've got different teams with various expertise on, for different organisms and they use methods to get out the DNA in a tube like this which we then send for full genome sequencing. And what is genome sequencing? Sorry, I need no, to know. No, that's perfect. Genome sequencing is where we use these machines that work out the order of the A's, T's, G's and C's in the DNA. So the information we get out of these genome sequencers is in these little big jigsaw of DNA fragments. So we need to then use these super powerful computers which then compare the fragments and see where they overlap um, to then piece together your full complete genome. Just for a sense of scale, for a genome for this daisy for example, um, if we were if the letters were all this size, it would stretch all the way around the world, the genome of the daisy. Amazing. Once we get our genomes, we then need to study them to get the most out of them. So we've got um, computer scientists called bioinformaticians. They study these genomes and find the most interesting parts. And at the end of the project, we intend to have 70,000 species, so that'll be, we'll need a lot of bioinformaticians to study those genomes. That is a lot of species. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, thank you so much for explaining that to me. I'll go and catch up with Ilya and Ross. Pleasure. Thank you. Well, it was so interesting to speak to Erna just then. What happens, Ross, once we have the genomes? So once we have the genomes, that's when the really interesting stuff can happen because that's when the analysis happens. And actually, we don't really know necessarily what we're going to find. We're spending all this time and effort gathering all of this data and we don't really know what it's going to lead to. If you think back to Darwin himself, he didn't set out to discover the theory of evolution when he set sail aboard the Beagle, but it was by collecting the data that led him to that conclusion. But we are already making strides in that area. At the Earlham Institute, we've sequenced the genome of an organism called Euglena and it kind of lives in ponds, it's that thin scummy layer you sometimes find on stagnant water and it's quite often mistaken for an algae but it's not related to algae at all it's actually got an algal cell living inside its cell it might be that we can bioengineer this to fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and produce biofuels which could have huge implications for climate change and global warming So fascinating and Elia you said earlier on 70,000 species how are you getting on? We're getting there, we're starting to get towards our first target, which is to release the sequences for nearly 2,000 species by the end of this year. We hope to be then moving towards our next target, which is to go for the 10,000 species and build up from there. So we're getting there. <laughs> Amazing. Well, good luck with it. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the Darwin Tree of Life project. It's a collaboration between 10 different research institutes, so Kew Gardens, Wellcome Sanger and Earlham, who we met today, plus seven others. They're all working together to sequence the genomes of all those plants, animals, fungi and protists and share those genomes with everybody. 
They're going to be providing new tools for conservation, new ideas for biomedicine and bioengineering, new connections for better understanding evolution, and they're going to change the way we do biology. So from one way of studying plants to something completely different. Now I'm joined by Dr. Marina Freitag from Newcastle University, who's been working on using berries to solve problems in renewable energy. Marina, tell me more. So what we do at Newcastle University is developing indoor photovoltaics. Indoor uh, photovoltaics, okay. And we want to replace batteries mm -hmm. actually to power Internet of Things devices and wireless devices just to make our life a bit more sustainable and energy efficient. So we no longer have to plug our phone charger into the wall when we're at home. We can have a device that will charge it, gather electricity just from light that's inside. Yes, so we use then yeah, energy basically that's usually untapped, which surrounds us. So I would say light is the only form of energy we can see and we should use it. Makes sense, definitely. So whereas the sort of um, the solar cells that we might have on our houses at home, they rely on the sun's energy, right, the sunlight. What you're talking about is light that exists indoors, but that we can still harness to produce energy. Exactly. So, of course, the light indoors is much, much less intensity, mm. just 1,000 still of solar radiation. And it's a very different spectrum, so we specifically make to match the spectrum. Okay. And how do the berries come in? <laughs> um, I would say berries come in very nicely because they have dyes which can attach to a semiconductor that usually does not absorb the light well. Okay. And it's there nice and dark and match very well the visible light. So the idea is that you have your sort of photovoltaic material that you can make more sensitive with the substances from the berries so that they can produce more energy for the light that's falling on them. This is at least what we let the visitors do. And um, I don't know if I can show this. Yeah, please. Uh, so what we usually have, we just have a semiconductor here and mm -hmm. it's titanium dioxide. This is what you have on everything that's white in your life, basically. Every Sun time, cream. sunscreen. Yep. In some countries, donuts. What? <laughs> you know, wall paint. <laughs> okay. And then we have another electrode, which is just has a stick on it to stick it together. Uh -huh. And in between, we put them in uh, berries. Oh, literally. Thank you very much. Berries. It I'll smells nice. It smells very nice. It does smell good. Yes. That's my lunch, thank you. <laughs> oh, but yeah, okay, so I can, see, I can see what you're holding up actually buried underneath here. So you literally put the titanium dioxide into berries. Yes. And it functionalizes it yes. somehow. Yes, so the dyes and the berries have an acid group which attaches to the semiconductor, to the white paint. Sorry, I've just broken your tweezers. It's okay. At least I didn't break the photovoltaics. Okay, I'm trying <laughs> to hold it up. There we go. Uh, it's not toxic. If you don't worry about your fingers. It's oh, good, okay. Oh, so I can just pick it up? Yes. Amazing. It's, it's just, just berries. berries. <laughs> exactly. Right, that makes sense. Okay, so we've got these little dye sensitized solar cells. Fine. How do we um, connect those up to electronics? Uh, pretty much like this. So we have two electrodes, as I said. One is a photo anode and one is a counter electrode. Uh -huh. And here we have the barometer. It's our homemade IoT device, actually. And um, what it does is it communicates with the internet, of course. So once mm -hmm. I press this red button, you can see it here, it tweets. So my solar cell tweets its own results right now. What? <laughs> so if you look on Twitter, it will say, hello, yeah. my solar cell. And right now on the screen, you can see the QR code. So if anybody's we usually have them on a stick. If anybody scans us, they have their own results always available. So, so our point is to show how we have sustainable solutions even for the newer technologies. Wow, fantastic. And so this is a substance, right? The, the, the molecule that you've got from these berries is a natural material. It's a natural substance that is created by nature. Um, what's the benefit of this type of approach compared to what's, what else is happening in dye-sensitized solar cells? And I would say that in a laboratory scale, we don't directly use berries, but what we do is we take the dyes from the berries and just make them better. Sure, okay. So right at the moment, we call dyes and cytosol solar cells also biomimetic solar cells because okay. we really try to mimic what happens in the nature yeah. and make it better. So biomimicry is this idea that we look to nature for inspiration or materials that we want to create in the lab 
find out how they work and what's going on there and then try and create synthetic materials or synthetic you know, substances or molecules in the lab so that we then don't have to go and buy blueberries from the supermarket every time we want to make a solar cell. Yes, <laughs> very good. Um, I wouldn't dismiss berries so much. We calculate that one of those berry cells is actually can compensate for one, uh, one of those coin batteries. You uh -huh. know, some people don't watch it, so it's, it's not so bad. It is quite a lot of energy it already saves. That is, yeah, massively. Um, so tell me about how we can kind of see how these devices are sort of converting that energy or kind of making this electrical energy. Is there something that we can see on the laptop to sort of show that happening? Unfortunately not. I would really recommend just come over and make a sure. solar cell. Yeah, okay. So, uh, how you can imagine is that uh, this paint you have is actually nanospheres. It's just 20 nanometer thick balls basically and what they create is a massive surface area for those dyes to attach. This is how they get so colored because the amount of the dye of course it's very very little. Mm. Yeah. How did we kind of first come up with the idea of mixing berries with electronics? Oh, I think it was 91 when Professor Michael Gretzer who is in EPFL Switzerland actually came up with a nanoporous uh, titanium dyes also with the spheres mm -hmm. and back then he used ruthenium dyes which are okay. not the very most sustainable materials. Sounds quite toxic. <laughs> <laughs> it's also very expensive okay. I would say but back then he already got seven percent and then several research groups started to also look into mm. natural dyes. Uh, so I would say every country has their own favorite dyes. Okay. It is berries in UK. Yeah awesome. So how far are you then in terms of commercializing this? There's several companies right now, I would say, in every continent that are looking into dye-sensitized solar cells mm -hmm. for indoor, specifically, yeah. actually. Yeah, okay, so you've got a few competitors. But not in UK. In not UK. in the UK, <laughs> excellent. So, yeah, when do you think you might be able to start commercializing this? Uh, me, myself, let's see, I'm working on it. Uh, Rico, a company, for example, in Japan is already printing them. You can get them and power your little devices with it. They might not be as efficient as ours, of course. Got you, of course. <laughs> um, so is this the sort of thing then that you would be able to buy um, and have in your home and it would provide free energy, essentially, to power devices and to provide energy to various electronics. Could you take it, for example, camping, you know, would it work in a tent in kind of that sort of environment as well? I would say this is a little bit too little energy if okay. you consider a tent. What I would like to see them is uh, consider that 75 billion uh, IoT devices will be distributed worldwide mm -hmm. in the next 10 years. 70% yeah. of them will be indoors. Mm -hmm. And right now, I wouldn't say this is necessarily energy saving technology. If sure. you consider that each of them needs a battery or needs to be wired. Yeah. So I want to tap and make this technology actually sustainable. Got, yeah. And this technology is there is to actually help us to reduce energy footprint for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. And you talk about the Internet of Things. You mentioned that this is the idea of you know, lots of different devices that help us do all sorts of things in our daily lives that are all connected to the internet and all sort of talking to each other and making our lives easier. Um, why specifically are you looking to power things that are internet of things things? Why, what, you know, why not just something that isn't connected to the internet? Mm, it's, I think yeah, recently uh, or let's say a couple of years ago I read the paper in, in science actually and it said that because there's of this vast amount of devices being deployed so I got worried that it's basically every human will have 10 devices on their neck. Okay. So I thought really this is a moment where you can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So it's to do with the rise of the Internet of Things that yes. will need power somehow. It's called the fourth digital uh, revolution for a reason actually. Wow, and that's all to do with the fact that we now want everything to be internet enabled and yeah, talking to things. We this technology will, is already everywhere. We just don't realize it anymore because it's so embedded in everyday life. Yeah, okay. So the fourth revolution is already with us. Yes. <laughs> so you've been talking to members of the public now for a few days at the Royal Society Summer Exhibition. What have they had to say about this? I think it's amazing to see, especially children, how excited they are when they have their own mm -hmm. solar cells. I would say, so just a couple of minutes ago, we reached 1,000 solar cells. Oh, wow. We made just here, 
and I, I would say that 99% of, of the solar cells were their first solar cell. Yeah. So it it's gives them a sense how easy it is actually to make a solar cell. Yes. And how easy it to, be, uh, it to make a sustainable solar cell actually. Fantastic. So in the future then, would maybe individuals be making their own solar cells at home or is this something that would still be you know, mass produced? I don't think it's so unrealistic. In my first lockdown I was cooking solar cells with my children. <laughs> in my kitchen. It's very, very feasible. That's of course incredible. I know how to, but yeah. uh, it was all available online to be delivered home and I was cooking solar cells. Cooking solar cells, wow, fantastic. <laughs> Who knew? Fantastic. Well, Dr. Marina Freitag from the University of Newcastle, thank you so much for sharing your amazing technology with us today. Thank you. So, from plants to berries and now looking to the soil, we're now going to find out what the soil can tell us. Soil. It's one of the most underrated and little understood wonders on our fragile planet. Here's why. Far from being lifeless dirt, it's estimated that in a single gram of soil there could be as many as 50,000 species of microscopic organisms or microorganisms. And in one teaspoon of soil there are more microorganisms than there are people on the earth. But much of what lies beneath in this hidden and deep universe is still alien to us. Despite being literally under our feet, humans have so far only identified a tiny fraction of the extraordinary life teeming underground. But these animals and microorganisms provide an invaluable role. Millions of years of evolutionary competition have led the microorganisms to produce antibiotic compounds to fight their neighbours. And these compounds form the basis of many of the antibiotics used by us humans. We literally make medicine from our soil. No one knows how many new treatments could be lying under our feet, waiting to be discovered. One of the most special creatures living in soil is the earthworm. Darwin was fascinated by them and said, It may be doubted if there are any other animals which have played such an important part in the history of the world due to their importance in making and sustaining soil. Earthworms journey down and around, creating breathing holes like lungs in the soil. This creates space for plant roots to grow and keep soil alive. Under the soil there are also vast and intricate webs of fungal threads. Plants and fungi need each other to thrive, and so they do a deal. Fungi can't capture carbon dioxide to grow like plants can, but they're better than plants at mining the soil for nutrients. So they trade. Plants give fungi carbon to grow, and fungi give plants nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. It's a mutually beneficial relationship, and just one example of the interconnected ecosystem we're all part of. Plant matter decays and provides food for microbes. They provide food for worms. Worms are food for birds, and so on. Soil provides us humans with almost everything we eat. But it's not just about what soils can do for us. It's important we value, appreciate and crucially protect soil for a whole load of other reasons too. Think about this for a moment. It takes more than a hundred years to build just five millimetres, half a centimetre of soil. But just moments to destroy through chemical contamination, urbanisation, landslides, erosion and more. Some soil is really ancient, dating back millions and millions of years. The oldest soil on Earth is thought to be in South Africa and dates back 3 billion years. In the UK, our soil is around 15,000 years old and it formed after the last ice age. Soil is also a really valuable carbon store, capturing carbon, locking it away in stable forms deep underground. It stores three times as much carbon as all the plants on Earth combined, including trees. But because it grows so slowly, we need to protect what we have. We are not succeeding. We know many of the problems. Intensive farming is one of them. It releases carbon from our soils, and we're losing soil 50 to 100 times faster than it's able to rebuild. In Europe, 60 to 70% of soils are thought to be unhealthy. And in croplands in the UK, in less than 30 years from the end of the 1970s, we lost more than 10% of the carbon the soil had stored for us. And since then, well, we just don't know. Because in many countries, there's little data on soil. It's poorly protected and regulated. 
We grow on it, build on it, build from it. It filters and cleans our waters, reduces flooding and regulates our atmosphere. It's one of the most biodiverse habitats on Earth and a vital part of the nitrogen and carbon cycle on our planet. But the sad truth is, right now, soil hasn't enough champions fighting for it. We literally treat it like dirt. And yet there is so much untapped potential, so much wonder and so many secrets just waiting to be discovered in the ground beneath our feet. Welcome back to Summer Science Live. We've heard from all sorts of different scientists today on the science that they've brought to the exhibition this year. We've heard about how scientists studying the movement of animals in the water can help us reduce carbon dioxide emissions from shipping and it can help us study how animals are moving around our oceans. The Royal Society has a very long history in studying our oceans and I'm joined on the sofa now by Keith Moore, the Society's head librarian, to tell us about the exhibition that you've brought to the Royal Society, which is a, it's a collaboration between Google Arts and Culture. Um, tell us a bit more about your exhibition. Uh, well, it's about fish, <laughs> uh, or rather the kind of long history of marine expeditions, some of them sponsored by the Royal Society, uh, starting in the 17th century and moving as far as the 20th. So we want to tell the story of how people began to understand the, the depths of the sea and the ways they went about it. And how, why did we first become interested in this and how did we first start studying it? Well, uh, in the early Royal Society, and the organisation was uh, started in 1660, um, quite a few of the early scientists were, were interested in what was happening under the water. Obviously, uh, fishermen and mariners knew the surface of the oceans very well. Uh, but people like Robert Hooke, the Society's curator of experiments, began to design equipment so that they could start to see what was happening underneath the sea. Uh, so Hook designs a, a water sampling device. Edmund Halley, whom we, we tend to know better as a, an astronomer. The, 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 exactly <laughs> right. Um, he designs a type of diving bell and a diving suit, mostly for uh, rec reclamation. Uh, but uh, you can see that they began to get interested in uh, other things down there. And Halley, particularly when he becomes a sea captain, he, he leads expeditions to the South Atlantic, um, he begins to start collecting fish, drawing them and presenting them to the Royal Society. Fantastic. And what could this, these fish tell them about the oceans? What the Society was interested in in the beginning was trying to classify life and we're very familiar with mm -hmm. this kind of concept now um, but they wanted to try and record everything in the natural world and, mm -hmm. and give it names classify it uh, and be able to identify it the leading figures in this, this kind of area in the Royal Society were two naturalists called Francis uh, Willoughby and John Ray they uh, together uh, did expeditions and uh, collecting visits uh, in Britain and in Europe. And they decided that uh, John Ray would produce a, a history of plants, Willoughby would look after uh, animals, and, and collectively they, they'd produce this, these great works of, of natural history. Now, unfortunately, Willoughby died, so the work fell upon John Ray. And the Royal Society supported him in this, and he uh, produced one of the famous books of the early Royal Society, which was uh, The History of Fishes. The History of Fishes. So what did that contain? It contained um, identifications of marine life. So previously, uh, if something swam in the ocean, it was classified as a fish. Right. Uh, so if it was a crocodile, it was a fish. Okay. Uh, if it was a whale, it was a fish. Mm -hmm. So uh, what John Ray was trying to do was to uh, give names to things mm -hmm. but also exclude things as well. Yeah. Whales did sneak into his book, I should say. <laughs> they, are, they are mammals, we know. <clears throat> but uh, he, he begins to uh, look at previous illustrations in, in fish books. Uh, the Royal Society had its own museum which collected objects, including fish. <clears throat> and he produces this great work which tries to capture all the fish in the sea, or at least all the ones they knew about at that time. And uh, I have the Royal Society's copy right here. Wow, can we take a look? We can take a look. And you can see immediately, oh, it's yes. a very beautiful thing. 
and it has some fabulous illustrations in here of pretty much anything you can think of that was known at the period. Wow. And was it the explorers, the scientists themselves, that were doing these illustrations, or did they collaborate with illustrators for that? Uh, they collaborated, so yeah. the, there would be original illustrations, and sometimes they were taken from other books. Uh, the Royal Society had some fish of its own, of course, and these things would be sent off to the engravers, and the engravers would produce these, these wonderful uh, copper plate prints. Society had a bit of a history of this. I mean, one of the great books that we published in the early days was Micrographia, which had wonderful illustrations of uh, mi microscopic uh, life, amongst other things. So they thought that a wonderfully illustrated book like this would be a runaway bestseller. And um, they decided to print lots of copies of it. It didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> Go on, tell me more. <laughs> uh, this is the book that uh, is generally considered to almost have bankrupted the Royal Society. Really? Uh, the Royal Society paid for the, the printing of it. Uh -huh. So there is text, as you can see in the beginning. Yeah. And it uh, got sponsors to um, uh, uh, give money to produce each of the copper plates. And, and very often you can see the names uh, of the sponsors just here. So this one is Samuel Pepys, who is president of the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. and, and he sponsored lots of plates in this right. book. But it cost so much that uh, the Royal Society was in some difficulties. Yeah. And they couldn't sell copies fast enough that they, in the end, were beginning to uh, use copies as a kind of currency. So they, they tried to pay people with, with, <laughs> with copies of uh, the history of fishes. Um, and uh, it, it, one of the reasons it's famous is because Isaac Newton's great work, Principia Mathematica, was also being printed around this time. Yeah. And the Royal Society couldn't fund that work because it had spent so much money on, on this one. Wow, so we nearly didn't have one of Newton's greatest works because right. of this yeah. book, The History yeah, yeah. of Fishes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we have an account book here from the Royal Society. So this is the manuscript accounts of the period. This is the 1680s. And uh, you can see rows and rows of figures mm. here of the money they were spending uh, to a whole host of engravers. Uh, there's uh, at least seven or eight on this page alone where they're farming out work to produce uh, the history of fishers and uh, the, uh, the money's going yeah. out in this column here. Goodness, wow. But presumably the Royal Society, you know, stood by the decision that this type of work, you know, documenting these animals was was worthwhile, you know, this was important yes. scientific work. Yeah, so this is, is pre-Linnaeus, who, who we know very well for, for classifying the animal kingdom. Um, but yes, the Royal Society not only paid to print the book, but quite a few fellows got involved in the, the process of trying to uh, classify the fish involved, uh, trying to eliminate some of them. So they did, Ray had a mini research team around him of, of fellows who knew a little bit about uh, natural history uh, and they helped to refine the work and, and get it through the press. Mm. So thinking then about science in the modern day, you know, this summer science exhibition is all about celebrating the recent research that's been going on. Where does this sort of work fit in that story and is it still relevant to researchers today? I, I think it is relevant. Obviously this is a, very much a paper exercise and the exhibition we have uh, in the building is to do with scientists not just sitting in an office and, and, and looking at this kind of thing but actually going out and finding out about the natural world. Uh, and uh, this is important. There's a long history of great voyages of discovery and uh, many, many of them were to do with uh, finding out about marine life. Um, we know uh, probably the most famous one is, is Charles Darwin's Beagle Voyage. Yes. Now we, uh, we tend to associate that with Galapagos Islands and, and Darwin's finches, but Darwin was, was collecting fish as well. He, he, he collected many specimens. The great 19th century exhibition, expedition was HMS Challenger, uh, which uh, occurred in the 1870s. The first properly Oceanographic, oceanographic expedition. Uh, the Royal Society helped set it up and it sailed the uh, world's oceans for years 
collecting specimens, finding about the nature of the sea, how it changed at depths, what the uh, uh, sea floor was composed of. Um, so it really it was a big moment in, in the history of science. And uh, today, of course, we're interested in the oceans for the impact that man is having on them. So uh, many of the 20th century expeditions that societies involved in to the Great Barrier Reef and, and to um, uh, the Seychelles, uh, they're important because you can see, you can be, begin to see changes in those environments. So the uh, uh, people at Aldabra are looking at plastics in the ocean, how much they can collect. And obviously, you know, um, uh, a few years ago, they, they weren't there. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef Expedition told us a lot about coral, so it's a benchmark for that. Uh, and of course we're very concerned today about uh, acidity in the ocean, plastic pollution, death of coral and, and many other things. So uh, it's, it's important that we look back on these expeditions to see what the oceans were like in comparison to what they are now. Yeah, the oceans are changing so rapidly that for us to have, I guess, this sort of timestamp to suggest how they were that you know hundreds of years ago it allow it gives us that benchmark to then compare the rate of change now and um, and sort of the importance of making sure that we are you know preserving these creatures that we know yeah. have been in our oceans and of course the deep oceans are still largely unexplored yeah. uh, and therefore uh, it wasn't just uh, John Ray and Francis Willoughby finding new things uh, there are new things still to be found in yeah. the seas so it's uh, worth preserving them t until we find out what is there yeah definitely so let's talk a bit about then so you're you're the society's head librarian is that that's the correct job that's title correct, yeah, yeah. Um, these look incredibly in incredibly good nick. <laughs> yes. What are the challenges with um, you know preserving these types of artifacts? Um, from this period, uh, paper is pretty good actually. Mm -hmm. So um, this is handmade uh, paper. It will last a thousand years if it's kept in the right conditions. So uh, we try to keep it in the right conditions. Mm -hmm. So the Royal Society has a huge collection of both uh, printed books and manuscript material going back to 1660 and even beyond that because uh, Royal Society fellows have collected manuscripts over the years, things of interest to science. These are kept in uh, envir environmentally controlled <laughs> stores. So they're kept at uh, standard uh, temperature and humidity uh, and the, the air in there is, is cleaned. Um, of course uh, things deteriorate over the years, fellows have used the books in our yeah. collections so they do need rebinding and repair from time to mm -hmm. time uh, and we, we do do that but today the movement is definitely towards uh, not just keeping these things in archive stores but getting them out to where people can see them not just in the search rooms yeah. uh, but online as well so we're uh, digitizing material very very hard at the moment and uh, we hope to launch uh, all of the manuscript content of the philosophical transactions uh, in uh, January 2023 and that will include unpublished material and things like referees reports on uh, what one scientist thought about another scientist's <laughs> paper. They're quite fun those ones because uh, there's nothing like a good argument between scientists. Definitely <laughs> and yeah and hopefully providing some comfort to scientists today that even the greats had their work criticised sometimes. That's right, even, <laughs> even the big ones had, had papers rejected, so uh, you, you shouldn't feel too bad about <laughs> We're it. We're all in this together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Keith Moore, thank you so much for talking to me about your job as um, head librarian at the Royal Society and for telling us the story of the history of fishes. <laughs> thank you very much, and it's great to get this, these, these, these things out there. Definitely. We're going to now hear from uh, over to Lancaster, where Dr. Michael Aspinall from the Lancaster University will be telling us about his work in monitoring extreme space weather. This morning I checked the weather forecast to see if I needed to bring a jacket or not, but I didn't need to because it's a lovely day here at Hazel Rig Weather Station near Lancaster. One thing I didn't check though is the space weather. I'm about to meet Michael who's going to explain to me what space weather is and how worried I should be. Hi, I'm Esme, nice to meet Hello, you. Hello, I'm Michael. 
So what are we doing here today? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this site? Yeah, we're at the Hazel Rig Weather Station. It's a Met Office field site and for over the last 45 years it's been collecting data relating to our weather here on Earth. What actually is space weather? So the sun is always spewing out material into space known as the solar wind. This is a stream of electromagnetic radiation and charged particles which travels towards Earth at a million miles an hour. As a result, a short haul flight gives you the same dose of radiation as a dental x-ray and a long haul flight more akin to a chest x-ray. That sounds quite extreme. So what are the potential implications from this extreme space weather coming from the sun? Should we be worried? Most of the time here on Earth, it's absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere or deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. But at its worst, it can harm astronauts, damage satellites and unprotected electronics and cause power grids to fail. Even scarier, space weather once caused a passenger plane to nosedive and it's even been attributed to some planes disappearing altogether. What's happening here is solar radiation passes through the electronics on board the aircraft, causing data corruption, essentially changing ones to zeros and zeros to ones. Another example is space weather causing a voting machine in Belgium to register an extra 4,096 votes for one candidate. Extreme space weather causes fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field. This is known as a geomagnetic storm. The Earth is covered in millions of miles of wire carrying electricity. When these are subjected to fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field, a current is induced. The current can cause the grid to overload, shut down and even fail. Here we have a coil of wire representing the millions of miles of wire that surround the Earth's surface. And here we have a magnet representing the Earth's magnetic field. When there's no geomagnetic storm, no current is induced, everything's fine. During a geomagnetic storm, when there's disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field, currents are induced in the coil of wire which can be detected on this galvanometer. This sounds like a really serious problem. How do we know when and where on Earth is affected? Space weather events have been monitored by ground-based instruments since the 1940s. There have been over 70 ground-level enhancement events, ranging from the barely detectable to the very strong ones. Leeds in Yorkshire holds the current record. On the 23rd of February 1956, their instrument detected an elevation of over 4,500% in background radiation. Unfortunately, that equipment no longer exists. I see. So are we at more risk nowadays? The only difference between the 1950s and even the 80s is our reliance on technology. Space weather has remained fairly constant over the decades, but we're making ourselves more and more vulnerable year on year. So how do we protect ourselves from this? Because I assume we can't stop space weather from happening. We can't stop space weather from happening, but if we understand it better and we're able to monitor it better, we can prepare vulnerable sectors and help manage space weather events safely. There are less than 50 monitors worldwide. None of these are in the UK. They rely on technology that dates back to the 1960s and the detectors are either highly toxic or made of a material which is no longer viable, too expensive. So what you're saying is that even though space weather is becoming more of a problem because of our dependence on technology, quite ironically, we don't have the technology here in the UK to monitor it anyway. Basically, yes. But researchers at Lancaster University, supported by the UK Atomic Energy Authority and UK SMEs, are developing a new type of cosmic radiation neutron monitor that's cheaper, more compact, and yet capable of producing comparable results to the existing network. It's our hope that data streamed from these monitors will feed into the Met Office Space Weather Operations Centre, enabling the UK to be able to better prepare and predict space weather events. In theory then, does that mean that when I check the weather to see if it's going to be raining on my commute, that there could be a space weather warning which might inform me of any potential disruptions? Maybe not quite, but it would certainly be used by engineers maintaining the national grid, aviation operators, satellite operators and even railway operators. Great, well thank you so much for meeting me Michael and here's hoping we can monitor any future events inbound to the UK. We wouldn't want this live stream dropping. Well, that's it from us here at Summer Science Live. We hope that you have enjoyed hearing about all the amazing scientific breakthroughs that are happening and that are being exhibited here at the Summer Science Exhibition 2022. If you've been inspired to learn more, you can watch lots of lectures, extra videos and extra content on the Royal Society's YouTube channel. So check that out on the link below.
The 2021 Summer Science Exhibition was entirely digital and that is all still available as well on the Royal Society's website. There's everything from activities, escape rooms, quizzes, virtual tours and it's all there for you to explore. You can do things like design your own aeroplane wing based on the wing of a bird um, and you can find out what a bee's favourite flower is or even discover where galaxies come from and everything in between. Um, so do check that out on the Royal Society's website as well. The Royal Society Summer Exhibition will be back same time next year. Um, so put the date in your diary now for the beginning of July and come along down to that. This year, the Royal Society's Summer Exhibition is still going on until tomorrow. As I speak, it's Saturday, so you can still come down on Sunday if you can make it down to Carlton House Terrace. All of the exhibitors that you've seen today will be still here tomorrow as well. So do come on down if you can to check out the end of the exhibition. Keep tweeting us online. We're still at hashtag Summer Science Live. We would love to hear from you, your thoughts, and you can put your questions to um, the researchers that will be able to get back to you too. So until then, it's a very warm goodbye from me. My name is Anna Pajajski. It's been a pleasure spending this afternoon with you, and we will look forward to seeing you here at the Royal Society very soon. Mm -hmm.